So, Andrew, I, uh, I honestly didn't think I was going to make it here this time. You know, to use your phrase, the, the matrix uh, got me for a while. You told me something happened. What happened? You know, it's, it's unbelievable. I got this tour going on in the UK. We're going in March. And uh, because I was coming to Dubai first, I had to have six months left on my passport. Yep. And my passport actually expired in June. So Ella's telling me, go get your passport done. I said, I'll do it when I get back. She says, you got to do it right away. You can't get an appointment there. I make a connection. I get an appointment on a Monday. Yep. I'm leaving Tuesday, yep. Tuesday night, right? Go there Monday, give them the money, go through the computer. Everything's fine. I go back Tuesday, Mr. Francis, we're sorry, we can't give you your passport. I said, why not? Department of Treasury has put a hold on it. I said, Department of Treasury. So they said, you got to call them up. I said, call the Department of Treasury? This is you, it'll take six months to even get through to them. Long story short, what I find out is somebody puts a fraudulent tax return, filed a fraudulent tax return for 2023. It wasn't even due yet. And I never file on time anyway. I'm always right, four months late. And uh, claimed I made $4,000 and I needed a $100 re uh, return, right? So the IRS looks at it and said, this is fraudulent. They don't process it, but they post it. So overnight, when I go to try to get my passport, goes over the computer, whatever, they stop me, right? So when I find this out, I said, well, who posted this? You know, who filed it? You can file it e-file. They said, well, we can't tell you because it's under investigation. They said, but you're fortunate, you gotta thank us. They said, thank you for what? Had we processed it, they would have put a warrant out for your arrest and locked you up at the passport office. This is what they tell me, right? So right now, I still can't get a copy of it. They won't give it to me. They say it's under investigation. Somebody did it. Yeah. Somebody just put it in there. But normally it would take four to six months to get this done. Fortunately, I was able to get it done in a month. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Well, the really interesting question is, the person who did this, do they even have a passport? Are they even a citizen? Who knows anymore? We've entered a new era of insanity where these kind of things can happen and we don't even know who did it. They may not have, have a social no security idea. number. This recently in London, there was a, I can't remember if it was a stabbing or an acid attack. Something heinous happened in London only a month or a month and a half ago to a little girl. And they were talking about how they couldn't find the guy. And London has the most CCTV in the world. And as much as I believe the UK is a failed society, the Met police are pretty good at wrapping up the violent people pretty quickly. They, mm -hmm. they do respond and find them. It's unfortunate they only come after the event. Mm -hmm. You'll get stabbed. But they, they might catch the guy once you're dead, which is kind of nice. But they couldn't find this person who did this extremely heinous crime. And I made the very obvious point. The only reason they cannot find somebody who did something so heinous in the middle of the day, in the middle of a city like London, is because they have no idea who this person is. He has no right. social media, no passport, no bank cards, no footprint. He came on a boat. Mm -hmm. He turned up. He murdered a native. And he's vanished because because who knows it? Who is he? You have a grainy CCTV image and absolutely nothing else. So, I mean, maybe I'm a not maybe I've been called it a few times. It must be semi true conspiracy theorist. But when you tell me things like this, just it sounds like people trying to game the system. And who are these people? Do they even have American passports or citizenships or any interest in the country at all? Or are they just there to exploit whatever they can exploit? Who knows? You know, but uh, I, don't, I don't know how the immigration system is here. I know it's pretty bad in, uh, in uh, the UK, but you got to see how it is in America. We have, we have probably 15 million people that have come into the country. And, you know, I spoke recently to uh, 850 Border Patrol agents in Texas. Yep. And they told me, Michael, you have no idea. We have no idea who's coming into this country. We don't know how many have gotten away. We don't know how much drugs is coming in. They have no idea. How much human trafficking is taking place? Human the whole bit yeah it's 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 scary and it's scary one because of the situation but it's really scary when you understand it's by design i don't believe it's an accident i don't you don't have to be, have any degree of a functioning brain to understand that a nation requires a border you can't sit and believe you have a nation without a border it's not a nation at that it's point. not a nation anymore right. so these people must be doing it by design you must then you have to go deeper down the rabbit hole why are they trying to do this and I, I see these little hints in the media. You see things and they say, you know, Trump might lose the election because of the undocumented voters. And I sit and think, are these people really busting their way into America and then urgently trying to find a way to vote? Or are they just letting them in so they can use that as a scam, make up the votes themselves? Don't put me in jail. But they'll just say, oh, this is the undocumented vote. And they'll just, they'll just print it and write it themselves and they'll just blame them. These people probably don't even need to vote. They're just the, the scapegoat for the scamming of the election. That's what I think they're doing it for. I've been saying this for months. There's only one reason, and this is totally political. They're letting them into the country. 
and that's to influence the voting. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. They want to turn the entire country blue, the entire country progressive. Yeah. They never want to get out of power. It's so funny because you look at the world, and my recent stint has me looking at the world quite hard, right? Because when you go to a jail or when you go to a court or a legal process in a country that's not your native country, you, you start to feel extremely patriotic. It's weird because I left the UK 10 years ago and I've been in Romania for a very long time. But when you're standing in a Romanian court and there's a Romanian national anthem and a Romanian symbol and everyone's talking in Romanian and you're just standing there like, I don't stand up. You don't I speak Romanian. Uh, right? No, I don't speak Romanian. I don't have a clue what's being said. <laughs> it's just like, da -da 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 jail. You're like, right. what? So you kind of feel patriotic. And then I'm looking at my host nations and I'm trying to find or looking at the world and trying to find somewhere I can feel home again, because I felt home here until this happened to me. We can go deeper down the rabbit hole as to whether America actually did this to me by proxy. That's another question. But you're looking at things and I, I see countries like Russia or I see countries where people can be proud of their leadership and proud of their nation. And I'm truly jealous. I'm heartbroken. When I see young Russian men who believe in Putin and believe in Russia and believe in the country, that must be such a beautiful feeling. I can't be patriotic like I want to be because our leadership is garbage. They're throwing the country down the drain. They're doing it on purpose. And you have to look at who you can't criticize because I don't truly believe freedom of speech exists anywhere. There's this idea that America has freedom of speech. That's a lie. Nowhere in the world has freedom of speech. There's always a class of people you cannot criticize. You can't go to Russia and criticize Putin. You can't live in Saudi and criticize the king or Islam. In America, you can't criticize trans, George Floyd, all this other garbage. And I'm like, well, if every single country on earth is going to have these taboo subjects, at least if you're not criticizing the leader who you believe has a national interest in improving the country, that's okay. You may not agree with everything your leader does, but if you know he's trying to help the country, right. you can be like, okay. But what are, the, what are the LGBTQ and George Floyd doing to benefit America? These are the people who are off limits to criticism. I'm not allowed to say I don't believe they're acting the right way. Otherwise, I'm going to be punished in some way. And they don't benefit the country in any way at all, ever. Not only do they not benefit the country, but they're in such a minority. And yet our leadership now panders to them like they're the most important people in the world. Yep. I don't get it. I really don't get it. And, you know, and I try to understand what their motive is on this. I, I can't understand it. I think their motive is primarily to just damage society at every level. I think, and once again, not to be pessimistic and not to be a conspiracy theorist, but I believe they've come to the conclusion that the American experiment is on its way out. The empire is falling across the next 50 to 60 years. They want to enrich themselves as much as possible, like a typical crypto pump and dump or stock Ponzi scheme. And they're trying to divide society to the point where we don't realize what they're doing and demasculinize as many men as possible so we don't resist what they're doing. And they find any agenda they can to purport, which will damage our capability of resisting it. So they're going to come along and, and do all this garbage. I, I did a, a podcast recently. I was talking about trans swimmers in female sports. And we were talking about how ridiculous it all is. And after about an hour in, I was like, the truly upsetting thing is that they've managed to convince some of the smartest, most eloquent, most interesting people on the planet who have podcasts to sit down and discuss whether a, a man should be allowed to swim with women. We're not talking about the fact that the fiat currency is a scam, that the judicial system's a scam, that the elections are a scam. We're talking about some swimmer with, 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 with a male genitalia destroying female swimmers. That's what they want because they've put up such a smokescreen of garbage that we're sitting here trying to go through the garbage. And the only reason we have to do that is because there is a proportion of the population who are so slave-minded they're slave-minded. Mm -hmm. They will believe anything they are told, anything they are said. So you end up having to argue against, like you said, this very vocal minority of 15% of whoever they are who truly believe that a man with a wig is a woman. And while we do that, they just plunder, plunder, plunder until it all explodes. And it's, it's, it's the patriot in me is heartbroken. It really makes me sad. Well, I agree. And, you know, the, the hypocrisy in all of that is uh, we have a country that's supposed to be standing strongly for women's rights. Yeah until you get a trans involved, and then you don't hear anything about the women anymore. Absolutely. And it's so absurd. Yep. A man cannot compete with a woman. Yep. You know, I mean, shouldn't compete with a woman. A yep. woman can't compete with him in sports like that. It's a known fact, but yet they're forcing it on everybody there. And it's, uh, you know what gets me, Andrew, more than anything? Listen, I was on the street. I was a gangster for 20 years. I make no bones about it. That's who I was. 
But that's who I was. I admit to it. Yeah. That's who I was. The Tate Francis sit down that we bring you today was sabotaged by Matrix attacks. Days before the meeting with Andrew Tate, Michael Francis's passport was confiscated by the US government. That same week, Andrew and Tristan Tate were rearrested by the authorities in Romania. Andrew and Michael have overcome all the obstacles to make this sit down happen. Hypocrisy in these people right now is what gets me more than anything. They're such frauds and they're such liars. They get up there and you know what would get me? Politicians get up there now daily, a daily basis. They had a thing, uh, I read an article, in 17 minutes, 17 minutes, Biden got on the air and lied 15 times. They fact check him, 15 lies in 17 minutes. And you talk to people about that and they say, well, it's politics. I said, it's not politics, it's lying. Yep. If your partner lies to you once, maybe twice, eh, third time, fourth time, you're 100%. done. 100%. These guys lie to you every single day and you support it, you say it's politics. It's not, it's lying. And the worst part about it, they lie to the detriment of the people that they're supposed to be benefiting. Yep. And that's why I've been ranting and raving about it. You know, I almost lost my tour in, uh, in um, the United Kingdom because of this whole thing. I have to believe that I've been very vocal, yep. like you, yep. you know, speaking up for what we think is right. Yep. And, uh, and they're coming after you for it. That's the bottom line. Well, absolutely, because your ability to speak freely is directly correlated to your insignificance. Yeah. You can talk if nobody listens. Yeah. People start to listen, you have to be careful what you say. Exactly. And then they'll come along and say, oh, this is a free country. Yeah, you can say what you want. And then they'll attack you anyway if you say things they don't like. The free speech psyop, well, it's very interesting what you said about lying in politics. I want to talk about that in a second. But the free speech psyop is interesting because America as a country is unified by two things. One is money. And two is this idea of freedom, which doesn't truly exist, I believe. But other nations may be unified by a language or a color or a flag or a national interest, whatever. But America is unified by the idea that most people believe they can get rich one day. And they're unified by this idea that they are freer than everybody else. So I think to keep this scam alive, they have to allow people to do stupid things they can't do in other places. Because you can't truly criticize from a vocal platform the leadership without getting wrecked. That's the same in every country in the world. America's no better. So to pretend they're better than a country like Saudi or Russia, they'll say, ah, but you can change your name and put a wig on. Mm -hmm. So we're free. Yeah. So they'll allow you to do insignificant garbage, but they won't allow you to stand up and do anything that's important. And then they'll say, ah, but we're free because look at this garbage you can do that nobody wants to do anyway, unless they're psyoped into it. It's really interesting what you said about politics and liars. That's the ultimate slave mind when you say people go, oh, it's politics. They've got us to a point now where we think it's perfectly acceptable and perfectly normal for the people that we hire to represent us to just lie the entire time. Exactly. And I mean, that's fraud, isn't it? I, I, don't, I don't know. You're, you're, you're representing my constituency and you vote against our interests every single time. 100% fraud. 100%. Listen, you know, and, and again, some people say, well, Michael, you were in a mob. I said, exactly. But I didn't pretend to be, you know, a, a fighting for the people. Yeah. We were fighting for ourselves at that point in time. Yeah. However, I will tell you this. We treated people better than they treat us. 100%. 100%. Our communities were safe. Our neighborhoods were safe. We didn't prey on innocent people. Yeah. These people, okay, they lie. They get on a campaign. They say this and that. They get in the office. They totally reverse themselves to the detriment of the people that put them in office. And to me, there's nothing worse than that, Andrew. And nothing then, worse. I, I agree. And then the only way this makes sense is if you look at the political landscape and you understand who they actually work for. Because people say, why are they doing this? I hear often people say, oh, well, politicians, well, they're just stupid. If they're so stupid, how come they're in charge of you? Yeah, they're not stupid. They're not stupid. You think they work for you. That's your confusion. You think they represent you. And you're like, why are they doing all these things? That's against my interest. Because you're not their concern. They work for somebody else. Exactly. And they're passing laws for their interest. The people who make the rules make rules to benefit the people who make the rules. They don't make the rules to benefit the common average person. You know, I, I catch myself doing this. A lot of the things I talk about in the world and how I view things, and I'd really be interested in your input on this because I came from absolutely nothing and now I have a little bit of money. And I occasionally catch myself being elitist. I catch myself being elitist. Like if I meet somebody who I went to school with, and we grew up in the same area and we've had the same amount of minutes of life and I managed to be monumentally successful and they can't pay their bills because they were too busy smoking weed. I don't feel sorry for them very much. I'm actually like, well, you're an idiot. You could have found a way out. You could have tried harder. There's always a way. You didn't try hard enough. 
And if you extrapolate that out, I'm somebody who was only poor 10 years ago. Imagine you're born into a banking dynasty. Imagine you're born into a lineage of people who have always been rich. Imagine how you're going to view the common man. Mm -hmm. They don't, they think we're cockroaches. They don't care about us. They don't, they have no concern for us on any level because they believe they're completely different. They're in a different class. They don't believe in nation states because they're globalist. They're above us in every way. They print the thing that we all slave around and run around for money. So of course they have no concern for, for us. So when they get a politician in power and they get him to pass laws that are to our detriment, it doesn't cross their mind that that's not what they should do. For the same reason, I'll make a law or I'll make a decision in my house that will be detriment to the ants outside. I don't care. It's my house and it's their world. And this is the reality of it. And I don't know. I'm very interested how that ties into your story with the mob and getting big and getting rich and getting famous. Did you ever get to a point where you're just like, you know what? You common people, I don't want to talk to you anymore. You get to that point. <laughs> Not that you don't want to talk to them, but you know, listen, we have a, a tendency to, to pity people, feel sorry for people. In our country, everybody has an opportunity to yeah. do something. There's no question about it. Yeah. And you got to look at somebody's past. If, like you said, they're laying around and they're waiting for somebody to do something for them and expecting something to happen, depending upon the government, well, I don't have any pity for that. You know, I don't. I have. I, I see so many people like yourself that started with nothing and made themselves successful, but they worked hard. Yeah. And they took advantage of the system when they could, mm -hmm. which is what you're supposed to do. So, yeah, I mean, look, it's natural. You know, you good. I had to check myself there. <laughs> no, because, you're OK. There. And, you're and, right. and another thing I think that's getting scary about the world, which is also an interesting thing. And perhaps this is a modern thing. I don't know. But I see a lot of these crimes and a lot of things happening. And I, I, I particularly pay attention to British crime because I, I feel more British than American. I spent mm -hmm. most of my time there. And you see stabbings on trains and all of these crazy things happening every single day. Shootings and London's getting really bad. And I was talking to someone and I said, we're at the point now where you almost just have to avoid broke people. And I'm not saying that in a horrible way. I'm saying you can't get on a train because there's someone on that train who can't pay their bills and is on the edge. That's just the reality of it. You can see it. Someone bumps into them and they just pull a blade and start stabbing people. Mm -hmm. You can't walk around in crowds. You can't go where there's huge gatherings because there ends up being a murder or a stabbing or a riot. It's getting to the point where you become more elitist because you're saying, well, I just need to avoid all of the people who don't have a lot of money and I can avoid 99.9% .9 of the world's problems besides the government because then they come for you. Yeah. But it's getting that way. And I don't feel like you'll know better than me, that the world used to be that way. The common man would be a good person and everything was fine and they loved their family and they had a degree of respect. But in certain towns in England, especially now, if you try and go anywhere and people aren't affluent, they've, they've lost all sense of morality. They just think, oh, okay, well, it just becomes a free-for-all. And it's dangerous. It's getting more and more dangerous to be around or, or just do a common thing or a normal thing, public transport, malls, anything. It's getting crazy out there. Let me ask you a question. Is that... In your view, because there are no consequences for these people? I think... Or they've been minimized to a degree where they can get away with it? That's, that's certainly part of it. But I do believe that humans are intrinsically good. And I think that as we're divided further and further down the scale, which is what's happening... We just end up finding an enemy of some kind. I believe that when you remove the homogeny of society, whether it be race, religion, anything, when you have nothing at all to unify and bind people anymore, you add on the pressure of people not being able to pay their bills. You add on the pressure of people slowly realizing how unfair this world is and how unfair all the systems we're supposed to believe in are. I think there's just a lot of pressure on people to just... I don't think a lot of people can take pressure. You can talk from jail. Oh, we can talk about our jail. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of people who wake up and they say... Let's take it this way. If you're an immigrant, let's, let's say, and I don't know this, I'm just guessing, because I try and put myself in other people's positions, right? I try and pretend I'm them. If I was an immigrant and I grew up in a strictly Islamic country in a war zone, I'm going to be battle hardened because I've seen terrible things happen. And I'm going to have this view of the West as this utopia of beautiful women and money and all this other garbage, right? And I'm going to leave my land and I'm going to go to England and I'm going to realize that one, I don't have really very much money. Other people may have some money, but I don't. Two, nobody really wants to give me a job because I don't have the work ethic they expect of me. Three, the women don't look at me as anything. So all these women who I have a bad view of, I view them as promiscuous because that's what I've seen in the music videos. Yeah. And I go up to them and I'm like, hey, and they're like, go away from me. That, that, that offends me. What do you mean go away? Why are you telling me to go away? Because I have this promiscuous view in my mind. You put me with 10 other guys who have no job. And we stand around on the corner all day. Like, how is this going to end anything other than crime? 
How is this going to end any other way? Because you get to a point, especially when you tell them the punishment for what happens to them is probably better than how they lived at home. You're going to say, well, right. get rich or die trying. You're and right. that's inside of every single man anyway. So when you add in the war zone and these other societal levels and these other psychological levels, they just don't care anymore. And and how can you police that? How can you stop that? It's it's scary because the police come afterwards. They they can't. It's the police come afterwards. That's the problem with all of this. Well, you know what? In America now, they don't even want the police to come. I mean, it's gotten so bad. And you know, people have said to me they had this whole movement. I don't know if you remember one. It was defunding the police. Yeah. <laughs> and genius idea. You know, I said to them, I said, let me ask you a question. You know, then, Michael, what do you think about it? You know, you you don't like the police. Just stop for a minute. Let me ask you a question. I'm on the street again, right? I'm doing what I'm doing. Rudy Giuliani, everybody knows him. He comes to me, he says, Michael, don't worry about it. You know, if we lock you up on a RICO case, you're going to get out right away. We're not going to give you any bail. No problem, you know? And don't worry about it. Maybe we'll give you a year in jail. Do you think I'm going to become a, a better person when I hear that, when I'm, I'm a criminal to begin with? Of course not. Yeah. When there's no consequences to your actions, you're going to go wild. Yeah. And that's what people, that's what they don't understand. You need law and order. And yeah. I think you believe that also. You've got to have law and order. There's Absolutely. no question about it. And when we're talking about this, and Andrew, I want to be clear with people. We're, we're saying these things because we see something going wrong and we want to fix it. You know, when I go on a rant about our government because I see them lying and I see them doing it to the detriment of the people, and that's why I get upset because I happen to love my country. Yep. You know, I was born and raised there. Hey, you know, I did what I did, but I understand when I went to jail, I deserved to go to jail back yep. then. You yep. know, different than you. Yep. I deserved it when I went to jail. But I love my country. I got, you know, I got seven kids. I got seven grandkids. I want the country to be right. Absolutely. And when I see these people doing what they're doing and destroying our the United States is going down. Yep. I'm going to tell you something. If we get another four years of this Biden progressive stuff, we're in a lot of time. I, I think it's the last chance. Away. It's it. I'm yep. telling you, it's over. It's the last chance. And it's really actually a very interesting argument because I completely agree with law and order and I completely agree with you what you're saying. When I got out of jail, I was analyzing because I'm enjoying, I'm a very lucky person. God has blessed me with the experience of the Romanian judicial system. So I'm trying to understand other judicial systems around the world. And I was like, well, where is fair? And you start to like go down the rabbit hole a bit. Mm -hmm. And you see that there's a lot of countries that have completely different ethoses when it comes to justice. So the American idea and the British idea, the Western idea of justice is innocent until proven guilty. That's the basic idea of justice. In countries like Romania, it's more, everyone goes to jail for a while, everybody. If you're even remotely suspected of anything, everybody goes to jail for a while. And then we'll let you out. And then in the end, unless you've really done something, you're probably gonna go home. So theirs is more scattergun. It's more, ah, you looked in a car window, we well, didn't break in, but you're looking in, and there was a car break in yesterday. Tough. Jay. It might be you. Yeah, that, that's how they work. Yeah. Now, that obviously comes with detriment because you end up in jail with a bunch of people who perhaps don't belong in jail. But then I look at the society here. We're in the poorest country in Europe. I walk around with a million dollar watch. I had a $5 million Bugatti. I'd park it on the street. Women walk home alone at night. It's so ridiculously safe because everyone fears the law. So, Perhaps it's detrimental, yes. And when you're in the cell, you're like, why am I here? But if you're not emotional about the fact you got caught up in it and you look around, you're like, well, society does function. People always talk about Japan and say, Japan's so safe, Japan's so great, Japan's amazing. Yeah, because there's a 99% conviction rate. Yeah. Do you telling me that innocent people aren't going to jail with a 99% conviction rate? 100%. What's the even poor point of the court? The court doesn't exist. You turn up, I did that, yeah, yeah. Jail. Yeah, jail. yeah, 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 jail. Same what happened to me. I, I went there and I said, TikTok, how can you human traffic someone on TikTok? TikTok doesn't even make money. Yeah, yeah, jail. They don't care. So you either fear the law or you have to fear the criminals. In the worst countries on earth, and perhaps we could say this is America currently, you have to fear both because the law will come for you if you're too big and you're telling too much truth. And the criminals will come after you if you're too rich. So you're living there with two enemies. Right. You know, that's the worst position to be in. At least in a country like Japan, you know, as long as I don't upset the law, I'll probably be okay. Yeah, right. let, let me tell you what happened to you. It's the same way that guys in organized crime, same thing happens. I'll tell you what happened. Normally a crime is committed and they go out and investigate and find out who the perpetrators are, right? Yeah. When you get to be somebody like yourself, 
there isn't a crime. They're investigating you, trying to figure out if you did anything wrong. Correct. It goes the opposite way. Yeah. And that's what they do with guys like us. Yeah. Okay, he's a bad guy. Let's figure out what he did. Yeah. So they start investigating, surveillance, all that, until they can nail you with something. That's what happened to you. I, I think and I've said this to many people. I said, you don't understand it. You don't know the system, whether you're Romania, U.S., or it's the same thing when you get high profile like that. This is what they do. 100%. They do not get a crime and try and find the name. They get a name and try and find the crime. Exactly. And and most people have no idea how all of these things work. They have no idea how ridiculous the legal code is in every country. You don't know the law. You can live in America your whole life. You don't know the law. You may think you know the law, but you don't. And when you go to a court, it's all subjective. They can have a, a page of law and they can have someone in there at 10 a.m. who goes home and they can have someone in there at 11 a.m. who goes to jail and he can go to jail for two years and the next guy in at midday, he goes to jail for four years. Mm -hmm. It's all subjective. Exactly. And, and that's what's so scary about it. They tried to pin a bunch of crimes on us. They tried the financial route. They tried this. They tried that. They ended up going for what they went for because it's actually very uniquely human trafficking is one of the only crimes in the world where the victim can say they're not a victim. So with human what they can do is come along and get a man and his wife. Say you have human trafficked this woman because you, for financial gain, mm -hmm. have convinced her to do something. You be, and with me, it's the lover boy method. By being nice, not by physical coercion, not by being. They're not even saying that. They're saying he used nice words to convince this girl to do something for financial gain, which I guess is every single employee boss relationship in the world. Yeah. Then when I say I didn't do it, when the girl herself says, I didn't, she I didn't that. do it, they can still, the state can come after you. So you have a victim defending me, me defending myself, both of us on the same side of the stand and the state trying to wreck you anyway, no matter what the victim says. Human trafficking is a unique crime in that regard. Yeah. And I guess they're doing it because they're saying that women can be brainwashed or whatever, whatever. I don't know how they came up with this idea. Which is another interesting argument. You know what, as I go through this, it's so interesting because I try and highlight the hypocrisies in these things. I say, well, I have daughters mm -hmm. and maybe I'm crazy, but they're gonna listen to me <laughs> and I'm gonna have a, a big influence in their life. But we're now living in society in the West where we're saying women shouldn't have to listen to their fathers. Women shouldn't have to listen to their boyfriend. Women are sovereign individuals and come to all their own conclusions because they're adults. Fine, I agree with that. But if that's true, you can't then say that they're so stupid that they'll do anything a man tells them to like this and that they can't tell their the own other. point of view in court and that they're just lemmings. Which one is it? Yeah, it's so one or the other. It's one or the other. So they're trying to push all of this feminism thing. But the second a woman, a second there's a man they don't like, they turn around and say, ah, oh, women are not sovereign. Women are stupid. You, they call me a misogynist. The courtroom is misogynistic. I'm sitting in a courtroom where a girl is saying, he's never done anything to me. I asked him how to get famous on TikTok because he was famous on TikTok. They put this whole case together based on garbage and stupid YouTube videos he made. And they're trying to take him down. He's never hurt me. I have no problem with him. I don't want this case. I'm saying the same thing. And they're saying, no, she, she doesn't know what she's saying. Who's the misogynist? The, the state. So it, let me, it, it, this goes in front of a jury here also? How does no, it work? It goes in front of a single judge. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Welcome to the judicial system. And, and who does the judge work for? Well, that's right. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 who, who, who selected this judge? Yeah. And, and this is another thing that I find so interesting because people How, are- Let me, how's he been so far? Because he did eventually let you out, right? Yeah. So the Romanian judicial system is effectively you have a tribunal judge, you have a singular judge, and then you go to an appeal. And the appeal, which is whether I win- if I win, they appeal. If they win, I appeal. So you always go to appeal, which has three judges. And they're all supposed to be randomly selected. I kept running into the same ones. Mm -hmm. Fine, funny, funny that. Right. Um, but it's all supposed to be randomly selected. And they basically have the final call. There's no jury at all in anything. And they just decide everything. And, and this is what's interesting, that people at home are so ignorant that they believe that a case which is large enough, like look at your case, your case and what happened to you and your people will affect the streets of New York. It'll affect 20 million people. Mm -hmm. You think they're going to leave that up to someone with a law degree? Do you think they're just going to leave it up to some guy with a gown who studied in a book? Or do you think they're going to say, you know what, there's 20 million lives at stake. Mm -hmm. So let's just do what has to be done to just, just fix this. Right. You know, that's how the system works. Yeah. I'm in the very lucky, fortunate position where my case affects the reputations of a nation. Mm -hmm. And they can say, oh, it's only Romania. Only Romania. Romania is the fastest growing economy in Europe. It's an EU nation state. Right. 
It, they, it's not as poor as people think it is. You'll drive around and see Lamborghinis, Ferraris. You see penthouses. It's a very, it's a real place. It's richer. Bucharest is richer than Madrid, Rome, Berlin. Really? Per capita. It's a real country. And their reputation's on the line. Do they leave that up to some judge? Just some judge fairly. Just some judge who read a book. Or do they, does someone come along and go, you know what? Even, even if he didn't do it, just say guilty. Just a couple years. Just, we're going to look bad if he walks. Right. We're going to look bad if he walks. I mean, there's some people are naive enough to sit and go, no, those conversations don't happen. But those people haven't been in rooms like you and I have been. Because if you've been in the right rooms, you understand those are the exact conversations that happen. That's, that's, that's the whole world. Exactly. The whole world is really as simple as people walking into rooms and saying things. That's what government is. That's what education is. That's what the mob is. <laughs> that's what business is. It's people walking into rooms and saying, yeah, you do this, I'll do this. And what benefits us? We just talked earlier about how the, the, the elite establishment and how they make rules to benefit themselves. I, I would be flabbergasted. In fact, I would bet my life. It is impossible that politicians in Romania have not sat down and go, how are we going to play this out? Because this has become a big mess. 100%. Of course. 100%. It All this backdoor stuff that goes on. You know, it, it's similar to Trump, one of Trump's case. One of. The guy's got so many. It's between criminal and civil. I've never seen anything like it. But, you know, he sat in a civil case where he was supposedly defrauded a bank. And the bankers got on the witness stand and said, he paid us every single penny. Yep. He paid us faster than the loan was due. Yep. And we would lend him money again. Yep. Lend him money again. Yep. And they actually uh, filed a suit against the guy. He lost the case. This is what people don't understand. Your government, I, I, I've seen a, some, some examples of it. There's a few people, I can't remember the name. I'd love to remember the name, but there was a guy who lived on a farm and he was raided by the FBI in, in the 90s for an illegal firearm or something. And they killed his wife and all this insanity. I don't think people realize just how crazily dictatorial and evil a government can be. And it's a system. It's, it's like a faceless system. You're grinding against this faceless system. And that's what's been also so interesting about my case, because I'm sure Trump has the same thing. I guarantee you when Trump walks into that courtroom, the police officer who walks him in there is like, sorry. You know, like the judge may be against it, but everyone else involved in the whole thing are probably, maybe not in New York, I don't know. But in my circumstance, it was very interesting. The cops who arrested me were like, sorry, bro. Yeah. The guy's in jail, sorry. The, the guy taking me to court, sorry. The police officer driving around, sorry. It's just part of a system. They know it's a setup. They, they know. That's why. They, they know. know it's they a setup. It. Yes. But, but there, it's part of it. Everyone's a cog in this big, huge machine, and nobody can really save you. Yeah. And you're going in and out of jail, and every single person you meet is shouldn't be here. I'm like, what? Well, <laughs> it's, it's, it's insane. And, and, and yeah, well, you know. And it's, 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 it's crazy how dangerous it all is. And, and they're coming for Trump now. And this is the thing. You don't know the law, and the law is so ridiculously subjective. They can get anybody for anything at any time. 100%. That's what people don't realize. I have so, The most ignorant thing you can say is, well, just follow the law. Just follow what? You haven't read the law. How are you going to follow a book you've never read? You don't know what the law is. Yeah. And if they want you and they pick you up, you're going to learn very quickly that you've been breaking laws the whole time. Every single person, I guarantee there's nobody who's lived a full year inside of the United States who hasn't broken some law. I don't think there's anybody that goes through a day without breaking something. There's so many laws on the books that are antiquated, but they're still there. They're still laws. Yeah. And you break, they're ridiculous. If you read, if you, if you ever read some of these statutes, you'd laugh. You'd say, no, this was probably 200 years ago, but it's still a law on the books. That's right. But you know, I tell you this, when it, when it, and, and people need to understand this. And I, I know this about you, Andrew, because I've been following closely. We're not ranting because we just, you know, we're revolutionaries. We're not revolutionaries. We see something going wrong. Yep. We happen to care about people, okay, care about our families, and we want to make it right. Yep. And that's the only thing. We're, that's what this is all about. You know, there's two things that you always have to worry about in a country, and it's happening in the United States big time. Number one, when the party in power starts weaponizing Department of Justice, the legal system, and law enforcement to go after their political enemies or the enemies that just don't agree with their ideology and, like yourself, we're vocal about it. Yep. That's very dangerous, number one. And number two, whenever the media goes along and doesn't report the news but plays cover for the people in power, yep. because then people don't really know what's going on. Financial anxiety, anyone? Worrying about it doesn't help? Earn in does. Earn in is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to $100 per day or up to $750 
per pay period. Just download the Earn In app and verify your paycheck. Then access up to $100 a day as you work and leave an optional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. If Jen wants a special night out or another bloody expensive handbag, I'm going to have to turn to Earn In. Make Earn In a part of your financial routine and join Earn In's over 3.5 million customers who say things like, when I think about Earn In, I think about financial stability and security. It gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earn In today, spelled E-A-R-N-I-N, in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earn In app, type in Sean Atwood on the podcast. That's S-H-A-U-N-A-T-T, Wood. When you sign up, it'll really help this show. at Sean Atwood on the podcast. Earn In is a financial tech company, not a bank, subject to your available earnings, daily max, pay period, max, and location. See earnin.com forward slash TOS for details. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank and Trust, member FDIC. Thank you for supporting our sponsor, Earn In. Back to the podcast. The link is in the description box below this video if you're watching it on YouTube. Cheers. That- they don't know what's going on. Yep. And you know, you look at social media. I've, I've had, I can't tell you how many people. Why are you sitting down with Andrew? I said, well, why is Andrew sitting down with me? I was a former gangster. He could say, I don't want to bother with you. I said, why do you ask such a dumb question? You know, I tell him. We're sitting down because we're having a conversation because there's something there to be talked about. And what do you care what I'm sitting? You know, I, I got to tell you, you know this too. Social media has exposed the lunacy in the world. Absolutely. There's no question about it. Absolutely. I mean, some of the things you hear. The problem is people judge you from what, they're, what they see or what they hear from someone else on social media. Yep. And it gets into their brain and you can't get it out. And this is the ultimate position of the slave mind because there are people who have a visceral reaction of anger towards me or towards you or towards anyone you can name. And they feel an emotion, right? And emotion's a real thing. Anger is a real thing. They'll feel a visceral emotion for a person they've never met based on an edited news segment from a propaganda organization. They're gonna sit there and go, well, this propagandist has told me this and now I feel rage towards this person I've never met. They haven't investigated anything. They haven't dived down the rabbit hole. They don't care. They, don't they care. just instantly comply and believe. If they can make you feel emotions with a short edited clip, well, then you are the enemy of freedom. You are the exact type of people they want so they can play clips on the news, you get angry, and do whatever they tell you to do. You're the worst person in the world. And another thing that people just lack so much brain if, 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 you, if they were to come to me and say, Michael's got a new case, he's back on the streets, crime, crime boss, da, da. they put it all over the news and tell you your past and you're a crime boss, da, da, da. and they say, look, here's an indictment. I'm going to say, so wait, the police wrote this and the media wrote that. <laughs> so I don't care about any of it. It's all a lie. It's all a scam because it's a one-sided story. People are going to be full-grown adults and not understand that one-sided stories always end one way. You can't ask the media or the police anything about anybody. And then the scary thing about all of this is what we were talking about earlier. If you actually do a crime, like a bad, heinous thing, you rob a grandma, they seem to let you off. They don't seem to punish you like they used to. No. And, and that's a really big rabbit hole to go down as to why they're doing that and why they're trying to make society so unsafe. Perhaps it's because the only thing the human mind will accept a reduction in freedom for is safety. The only thing that will make you say, okay, take my freedom, but make me safe. So the worst things get The more dangerous it becomes to leave your house, you might end up agreeing to being locked in your house. And okay, you deliver my food, you deliver my bugs, and I'll stay home because it's it's dangerous out there. That's the only thing we'll give up freedom for is safety. You're right. So that's why it's getting more and more crazy by the day. El Salvador, the president of El Salvador, has proved you can fix any mess. He he, he cleaned it all up. Mm -hmm. Are there some innocent people in jail, like we were talking earlier about Romania, Japan, et cetera? Probably. But he's fixed it. I don't know if you've ever watched. Have you ever watched his speeches? No. Oh, he's, he's, he, El Salvador went from the most dangerous country in the Western Hemisphere to the safest. And, how, he, and what length of time? A year, year and a half. He just turned up, built a mega prison, said, if you have a tattoo or you're related to a gangster or you're in a house with a gangster, you're all going to jail. And he just locked up everyone, head to toe, everybody. And now it's the safest country. And he's saying, now they're going through the judicial process. They're going to do some jail. And some people who are innocent are going to eventually get out. And everyone tells me that I violated human rights. That's fine. What about the human rights of the people who are getting murdered on the streets? We had the highest homicide rate in the world. Everyone was dying. Everyone talks about human rights and the BBC and everyone wants to come along and ask me about human rights. I fix human rights because people can walk all around with their children now. 
So he's a, he's, he took drastic measures to get something done. I'm not saying America should do that, but I'm saying I'm sure with the monumental resource they have and the amount of time they spend going after Bitcoin millionaires like Roger Ver or in trying to convince the Romanian embassy to put me in jail for talking online or keeping an eye on every single person who's a Trump supporter, perhaps they could, I don't know, stop grandmas getting murdered if they wanted yeah. to. All they need to do is go back to the way it was and enforce the law. That's it. Yeah. They don't have to do anything real drastic. They have to stop minimizing what they're doing now. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. You get a guy in organized crime, and I have to keep going back to this. They'll investigate him for 10 years for shaking down somebody for some money. Yeah. Not beating them, just shaking them down. Or, you know, for gambling that the government is running now anyway, you know? <laughs> so, many, so many of my friends went to jail for gambling, and the government is now is in the biggest business of gambling that there oh, is. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, all they have to do is enforce the laws the way they used to. They don't have to do anything drastic. That's it. Yeah. And they won't do it. Yeah, they won't do it. And it's it's... It has to be purposeful, and that's Listen, what's scary. When I have to tell my daughters, you know, I have to give them pepper spray to carry around. When I tell them, when you go into the parking lot, make sure you look around you because people are waiting, you know, by your car to grab you and, and either kidnap you, human trafficking. Yep. That's real human trafficking. 100%. When they throw you in the car and drive you away in your car, and that's happening in affluent neighborhoods in, uh, in California, where I live. It's happening. It's, it's, you know what's crazy about this? I think this is one of the reasons why they've been so determined to detriment the contribution of masculinity to society because maybe maybe I'm paranoid maybe I'm crazy but I think true masculinity I see danger everywhere if I walk from my car to the restaurant my heart beats a little bit like if I get out of my car I'm the I, same way I've so got, I, I've got, I could totally relate to I've that. got guards with guns I've got security with me I can't carry a weapon I'm on bail but I have three men with guns and I still get out of the car and I'm, I'm saying well, that. that's how I am. If you have that healthy degree of fear and protectivism inside of a society, inside of the societal mechanism for making laws, you're going to be a lot more careful about opening a border, a lot more careful about letting someone off and not ba and not giving them a, or giving them a cheap bail when they've done X amount of violent crime. You're going to be the kind of person who's like, no, safety first. We're going to protect this. But when you add in all this subjectivism and this garbage and this feminism and this racial, oh, it's not his fault or it's not her fault or it's not this. They didn't do it. It's this, it's that human rights, bunch of garbage. You're removing the masculine capability to just protect what it cares about. I, I get the, I think one of the largest smear campaigns against me is I get called hateful all the time. The BBC who hate me, the BBC hate me. They're the propaganda arm of the British government and the British members of parliament stand around in parliament. I, it's the only time I watch those clowns. Mm -hmm. And they sit around talking about me. Andrew Tate's the worst thing that ever happened to this country. Not the stabbing, not the drugs, not the open borders. No, Andrew Tate said, go to the gym. Oh, the, he's worth a two hour conversation. Only time I've watched them clowns in a long time. Mm -hmm. So the BBC is after me, right? And they say, Andrew, there's hateful ideologies. There's no such thing as a hateful ideology if you love something. You're not hateful if you say, I love America and I don't want those people to come here. You hate immigrants. No, no, I love America. Mm -hmm. There's no light without dark. There's no equal, equal and opposite forces. If you love anything on the planet, you'll be called hateful against something else. The only people who aren't hateful are people who don't love anything and don't stand up for anything. The people who are just empty vessels waiting for the slave mind programming to convince them to be mad at us. Mm -hmm. If you love anything, you're a hateful person against something else. They'll call you hateful because they'll weaponize it and they'll try and take away the love aspect. I don't hate anybody or anything. I did a, I think it was with peers when I said that my, uh, my girlfriend doesn't work. It's like, why don't you want, why don't you want her to work? I said, she can work if she wants, but she doesn't have to. Why? Because I'm rich. Mm -hmm. You're a misogynist. How does it make me a misogynist? I'm a misogynist. She's in Chanel and get a facial. I, I love her and I take care of her, but that's it. No, I, I hate women now. This is how they spin the narrative. No, it's I'm gonna, insane. I'm going I'm to tell you what's going on. There is a thought process out there now that if you're telling a man to be a man, and we can talk about the qualities of manhood, that it's demeaning to women. Yeah. And I said, no, if you're telling a man to be a man and teaching him how, that's a benefit to women. Absolutely. And they don't get it. People yeah. don't get it. It's like you're taking a woman's rights away by being her man. Yeah. You know, look, I'm married 39 years yesterday, actually, 39 years. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And my wife could work if she wants to. Yeah. Do I want her to? No, I don't want her to work. She doesn't have to work. I don't want her to work. Yeah. But if she wanted to and she's real, okay, you can work. You know, She does all my video work, so she works for me. Yeah. You know, I just don't want anybody else telling her what to do. That's just how I feel. 100%. It's my wife. Yeah. I don't want another man or anybody else telling her what to do. Yeah. Okay, is that a misogynist? 
Most people would say yes. Yeah. But why? There's a large proportion of the population who would try and say you're a bad person. Yeah. Why? And 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 they do this because they're pitting us against each other. That's why they're trying to attack masculinity to the point where they will say, if you're remotely masculine, you are harming and hurting women, which of course is false, but they try and keep the genders divided. That's what they mm -hmm. want to do because genders being united when you're two different parts of a perfect whole, that's the basis of society in the first place. We can talk about government, we can talk about all these things, but it starts with a man loving a woman, having a child, and then they decide to buy a house. If they can buy a house, as opposed to what's currently happening because they can't afford any of them, if they can buy a house, they're now interested in the schools, they're interested in the roads, they're interested in the town, mm -hmm. they'll go to the local county fair. The town can be extrapolated out to the state, to the city, to the government, et cetera. It starts with that. They've broken us at the nucleus of the cell. Men and women no longer get along because we have completely different ideas. And I, you can blame either gender, but truthfully, it's a race to the bottom for both genders, I think. Gender dynamics are now so fundamentally broken in Western societies that how can you build a society on the top of it? How can you build a society on the top of women who don't want to listen to their man ever? Men who don't want to marry a woman because she's either going to financially wreck him or he's not going to feel like the king of his own household, which is what a man wants. Why would you marry a woman who says, I'm not going to listen to you? Well, then why am I marrying you? What's the point in any of this now? Mm -hmm. You go down the rabbit hole of hedonistic insanity, this hedonistic sex and garbage. This is why we're in the position we're in in the West, right? Because you can also tie that in with the broken gender dynamic, which you have. You tie that into the female empowerment telling them that they're better than men at everything. You also tie that into everything that happens to them as a man's fault somehow because they're permanent victims. And that's, this is where you have all these fake rape charges and fake claims. How can this possibly be fixed when you have millions and millions of people having hedonistic empty sex on, on drugs and alcohol? Right. Telling men, and then telling the woman if they regret it at any point further on in their life, it's the man's fault. At the same time, she's better than the men in every single possible way. And these people are psyop by sex in the city and the internet and other garbage. How, of course, they're going to have millions and millions of fake claims and fake kidnapping, all this garbage, all these crazy things. I said this to the mother of my child. I said, listen, I love my daughter with all my heart. If somebody hurts her, I'll go to jail. Mm -hmm. I don't care. I'll go to jail. Of course. But if, if my daughter comes to me and says, I was what happened? I, I went out with a guy and I got drunk and I was drunk with him and I went to his house and we kept drinking and then I went in his bed drinking and, and I took my clothes off and then, ha and then I had sex with him. But now I think, because he ain't texting me, I don't want to. I'm like, I, can't, I can't in good conscience no. kill this man. What do you want me to do now? And this is all, this subjective garbage has come by the basic breakdown of even gender dynamics now. So we have masculinity under attack on every single level. I, I said this to Tristan some guy, an old friend of mine, it, me and him were joking because since I got this human trafficking charge, I get all these beautiful women around the world saying, you can human traffic me. Like it, they, they send me yeah. messages. <laughs> and he's like, oh, that must be fun. And I was like, I don't meet anybody. Mm -hmm. I don't trust any of it. Because there's no, there's no longer even consent in the Western world for a man. If she gives you consent and can post retract, then you never had it. Right. So you, you can't even have relations now if you're famous, right. really. It's gotten to that point. It's gone to that point where the, she can go, yeah, we're in love. We're doing that. And you can, you can be together for three whole months and enjoy each other's company for three months and be together every single night. And then two years later, she can change her mind and retract all the consent. And okay, what, will you be found guilty or not? Well, that depends on the evidence in your phone and her phone. Yeah. But you're still going to need a lawyer. You're still going to go to court. Gonna go through the you're still going to get arrested. You're going to be punished by the process. So you can't even have consent in the West in any regard anymore. So how can you even have familiar relationships when you can't even have consent? And that makes men of certain status extremely scared. I also think, this is a pretty elaborate conspiracy theory, but I'm interested in your thoughts. I think another reason the Western world is so riddled, the leadership, the elites, is so riddled with this insanity and this disgusting and all this satanic rituals because I don't think in other countries they have the issues with the things we're talking about. If you're a Russian billionaire, you have your four girlfriends or whatever, and nobody cares. It is what it is. You're, you're a rich guy. You have your girlfriends. That is, is what it is. We have these elites in Western world who know that they can't ever truly have consent from a woman or they don't want to be seen with a woman or whatever, whatever. And they go to these private meetings. What do we say? The room is just people, the world's just people going to rooms and talking to each other. And they say, hey, there's an island where you can have fun and Nobody will know. Mm -hmm. And there's, don't worry about the consent thing. We've got it under control. It's this island. You know, they're, they're beautiful. They're younger. And they end up going down this rabbit hole because they don't have any, because society is now so broken. You can't even be a rich man and just have a girlfriend. 
You gave another girlfriend, they'll, they'll take your money, they'll wreck you, they'll come out in the press, they'll accuse you, you go to court. I, I, these well, have got to be linked, these two, these two different yeah. scenarios. I mean, they've schooled women to, to do that now. Oh, yeah, to take men out. Yeah, and you know, I, I have five daughters, uh, Andrew, and I tell them, listen, okay, they're very independent, yeah. every single one of them, okay? But I tell them, listen, you get a guy, if number one, he can't support you, he can't protect you, and you, you don't look up to him like he's somebody special and respect him, what are you doing with him? 100%. You know, now some people think, well, what do you mean? You know, I'm a woman, I can take care of myself. Well, yeah, you can take care of yourself, but that has nothing to do with what I just said. Yeah. You know, you want a man to be a man. Yeah. It's not demeaning to you. It's I'm not saying that he's better than you. He's a man. He's different. He has a different role in life. Absolutely. And people can't accept it. That's misogyny. To, uh, that's being misogynistic to certain people. Oh, completely. I don't have to rely on a man. Well, why not? What's wrong with that? What, it, it's, it's, it's so interesting because... <clears throat> I have sons and daughters and they're being raised in such different ways. But uh, my son is having a hard life because life's hard, right? Right. I, I walk past him. He's three. I push him over. He <laughs> gets up. It's like, that's life, son. <laughs> One day you're going to go to jail. Get up. Uh -huh. You know? <laughs> but uh, my daughters are, are princesses. Right. Like uh, my daughter's three and she's saying, I only want to fly private and all this garbage. Right. She's a, yeah, at three. She's a nightmare. <laughs> But I'm doing this on purpose because when he gets to a certain age, I'm going to say, look, the gravy train ends the second you get a man. Mm -hmm. So you've lived a very nice life. You have all the things you want and you have your bags and your cars and your private jets and you're very, very rich. But the second you get a boyfriend, the gravy train ends. If he can't pay for what you're used to, that's your decision. And you can't go back. You have to make a good call now mm -hmm. because I'll take care of you until another man comes. Then, then it's his job. You better make sure he has my kind of budgets because you're used right. to a certain lifestyle. This is my plan. I have the We're same, I have the same thing, and she's standing right over there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's the plan. Same thing. Yeah, because uh, the son is a completely different, you know, I, they're, they're from different mothers, and it's kind of unfair because the mother of my son's like, if I had a girl, my life would be so much easier because they're on jets and stuff, and you're like, I don't want him on a jet. No, I don't want him on a jet. No, I don't want him on a jet. I want him to stand in line. Right. And it's amazing how different the upbringings between the two can be and how my upbringing was. I often try and talk about how my dad raised me. And in the modern world, people will say, oh, that's crazy. That's abusive. He was nuts. I really believe I had the best dad on the planet. I don't regret a single time I had my ass whooped. I don't regret it ever. I probably deserved it. <laughs> if I think back, I, don't, I, don't, I deserved it. And it's crazy to me that we built the whole world with discipline in children. We've built the whole world with it. The pyramids were built when kids couldn't talk back to parents. Mm -hmm. The Napoleonic Wars, Mozart, the cathedrals, mm -hmm. every single thing you see that was created less than 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, was created with discipline in children. And now we're coming along saying, oh, you can't discipline a child. Oh no, you can't tell them to be quiet and sit down. Right. My dad used to say this all the time. He had a saying, he said, I don't negotiate with children. He'd, he'd come in and he'd change the channel. I'd say, oh, dad, I was watching that. I don't negotiate with children. <laughs> we're not having a conversation. There's no right. negotiation. Be quiet right. or face the repercussion. I said, like, yes, sir. Okay, mm -hmm. then I guess I'm watching this. You know, so the world's gone nuts. And <clears throat> I was saying this the other day. I saw something on TV about mental illness because I think a lot of the mental illness is overprescribed. And I'm not talking about PTSD. And, and even when I got out of jail, I had nightmares. Romanian jail is a unique experience. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the overprescribed mental illnesses because everybody, every kid in the world is a mental illness now, right? And they're talking about OCD and ADHD, et cetera. And there was this kid who was walking down the stairs and he had OCD. And if he didn't walk down the stairs in a particular pattern, he'd like skip one stair, turn around, go up a stair, then do a hop and then do a jump, some weird stair thing. And his two parents standing there going, if he doesn't go down the stairs in a particular way and we put him in the car, he has a mental breakdown, he starts screaming, we have to turn the car around, let him go down the stairs and he has OCD. And the doctor's like, yeah, he has OCD and he's just medicine. Da -da. I'm sitting there and I'm saying, I've never seen an African kid walking for water 10 miles, mm -hmm. turn around and do it again because they missed a step, ever, ever. This is not a disease. This is a brat with idiot parents who are enabling this kid. If that was my kid, I would drag his ass to the car and tell him to shut up. Right. And I'd fix it in a day. And we're sitting here with doctors, TV shows, pills. The kid, like, I, I, the world's lost its mind. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's the same with ADHD. They say, oh, my kid can't concentrate. Well, I wonder why. Your child has video games, iPads. It's enjoying this very fun life. 
It goes to school and has to sit down with a boring book of math and doesn't want to. Well, duh, that's not ADHD. That's lack of discipline. That's lack of discipline. <laughs> well, you said something very interesting that people wouldn't think would come out of your mouth because you're a misogynist. Of course. You just said you treat your daughters like a princess. Absolutely. Okay, so what's wrong with that? Well, I guess they're going to come along and somehow get the mothers don't have to work. So I guess that makes me a terrible person somehow. Yeah. I don't know. It's all this weaponized virtue. It's truly insane. Yeah, and people virtue. think, you see, people will turn that around to say that's demeaning to women because we're, we're, we're lowering their stature in life because we have to take care of them. Do you know, I can tell you this, since I'm married, since I'm married, I don't think my wife filled her car with gas 10 times, unless I was in jail. They yeah. tried to do it all the time. <laughs> I just want to fill her car with gas. Absolutely. Is she capable of doing it? Of course. Yep. Would she do it on her own? Of course. Yep. It's just, I'm a man. Yep. And I feel that these are the things that I have to do for, my, for the woman, for yep. my wife. Yep. You know, I do it for my daughters too. What's wrong with that? But if you say that, you're a misogynist. Oh, yeah. And, and, and they're trying to, and this is how they break down the gender role. And this is how they do it. Because that's how they fundamentally break down society. And I was in Miami. Last time I was in America was three or four years ago. I was in Miami. I was with a friend of mine from Saudi Arabia and we were in the club and I was saying, you, we were talking about how there's no real clubs in Saudi Arabia, there's clubs in Miami, da 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 And he, he looked at me and he goes, yeah, there's no clubs in Saudi Arabia, but there's wives. There's no wives here. And I just looked around and I was like, yeah, there's girls. There's no wives. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's, that's American society now. Right. That's the Western society. And, and it's going down this degradation. The thing I think a lot of people don't understand <clears throat> and I have this especially because I come from a very low income background and I still know a lot of the people I grew up with. And when they go, if I had your kind of money, I'd do this. Or if I had your kind of money, I'd do that. Hedonism is a black hole mm -hmm. that never ends. You can only get so drunk so many times until you want to take a drug and you do that so many times until you want to do both at the same time or whatever. You end up on a island whatever it is hedonism is a spiral to nowhere right true happiness in life is actually doing i believe and this is where we can talk about masculinity i feel happiest when i do the things i'm supposed to do because i'm supposed to do them just as you said putting gas in the car putting gas in my woman's car will make me feel happier than exactly. doing something insane or, or garbage maybe i've become boring in my old age I'm, i think i'm not quite as old as you but i'm getting there but now <laughs> you're half my age <laughs> <laughs> but like, if Don't I rub can, it in, Andrew. If, 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 if I can clear all my emails, right? I've had a good day. Like Maybe it's getting that way. I know when you're younger, you're a bit more reckless in these kind of things. But a, a lot of young people, a lot of men say to me, especially like, what's fun? And I'm saying doing what you're supposed to do and fulfilling your duty and being proud of yourself mm -hmm. is fun. That's the only fun you need. You don't need the fun of trying to chase all this garbage and this hedonism and this black hole. That, that doesn't lead anywhere. Did you do that for a while? For a while, yeah, certainly. So did I. Uh, you have to. Yeah. Until you get to a point where you realize, okay, this is never going to end. Am I going to continue to go down this path or am I going to turn around and just skip it all? Right. Because it, it only ends badly. And I think that's also one of the problems with Western society where the youth are obsessed with fun. If you look at other societies, the youth are not so obsessed with what's fun today. What's fun now? Mm -hmm. I need fun now. I'm bored. I want fun. You know, they're overstimulated, whatever it is. They're also selfish. They're also self-obsessed with how they feel. This teaching a, a, a whole society and teaching a large contingent of the youth that how they feel plays paramount over the world. If you feel sad, that's all that matters. Not, well, I feel sad, but it doesn't matter because I'm doing the right thing. I feel depressed or I feel stressed, but it doesn't matter because I'm dedicating myself. No, 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 no. What matters is how you feel right now, mm -hmm. which means they only want to be happy all the time. And if you're going to only chase happiness and you don't have any particular skills, you're going to end up just chasing hedonism. And this is where you end up. And it's insanity. I think one of the largest tenets of masculinity for the largest period of human time is ignoring how you feel and doing what you're supposed to do because you're supposed to do it. We feel things, mm -hmm. but jobs must be done, whether we are happy or sad. And, and this is also disappearing from the world. I'm, I'm stressed probably six days a week. I'm pissed off six days a week, <laughs> but things need to be done. Right. So you just have to do them. And when you have a whole contingent of the youth obsessed with only being happy, I think this is a large, this is one of the largest reasons they can sigh up them so easily into doing insanity. And I, I guess it never used to be that way. No, it was never that way. Without getting into the cause, I don't know if you know what's going on in the United States. A lot of protesting going on at universities. Yep, yep. Without getting into the cause, these kids are protesting 
okay, staying, breaking into the building, staying there, and then demanding that food be brought into them, of course. blankets be brought into yeah. them. And I'm saying, are these kids so entitled that they think they can, they can you know, protest and, and wreck the school for other people that can't get to class? Yep. And then they're demanding food and blankets and all these crazy things. I'm saying, this world has gone upside down. Yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't last in most other places. And, no. and the closer that, it's actually interesting because I think humans, or maybe this is just me coping, maybe this is cope, but I think we're, de we're designed to struggle a bit because the closer you are to struggle, the more sensible you are. Mm -hmm. And gender roles all fix themselves in struggle, right? If you have 10 men and 10 women and they crash on a deserted island, the men do the man stuff, the women do the woman stuff. There's no discussion about gender roles because you're gonna die. Right. So the men have to go hunting. The women are going to try and sew a blanket, whatever, because we're going to die now. Right. So we don't have time to talk about whose job's what. Right. Also, if you meet somebody who's had a hard life, they seem to be pretty wise. Yes. It's difficult to find someone who's had a hard life who's a total idiot. When you speak to these liberals or these morons, they've had very easy, soft lives. So I think humans are supposed to struggle a bit. Absolutely. And in the Western world, it's the age old adage. I know it's overused, but... Hard times create good men. Good men create good times. And the good times create a bunch of weaklings and they mess everything up. Yeah, it goes, it, it goes to a point and then it goes the opposite. It yeah. goes the opposite way. Yeah. These, th these people have had too easy lives for too long. And you can apply this to nearly any of the problem, any of the societal ills that apply to the Western world. People have had it too easy for too long and none of them know any struggle at all. I mean, I don't know about you. I can only learn lessons the hard way. I'll be honest with you. Like I... I can almost crash my car 10 times and I only slow down when I hit the tree. This is how I am. Like, I think that inside of, inside of the human psyche, sometimes you need to be shocked. You need to be hammered with something. That's just how it goes. Cause until then you're like, ah, maybe I'll, I'll keep it in mind. Yeah. Well, I got away with it. You yeah, keep yeah, going. Yeah. 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 yeah but right. when you finally learn your lesson, right. But there's a lot of these people out there who aren't being taught any lessons at all. And they're going to destroy society on mass because they have never had any kind of difficulty in their life. And what, it, what is life without difficulty in the first place? What, what is life, what is the point of life without difficulty? I, one of the things that's comforted me in all my garbage is actually, I watched one of your videos and I was watching one of your videos a couple years ago and it, I remembered it in jail because perhaps I'm wrong, you can correct me, but I don't think you regret any of the bad things that happened to you. Not at all. Because it makes you who you are. Yeah, not at all. So when people say, Andrew, what are you going to do if they lock you up for 10 years in Rehovah, the worst jail in Europe? I'm going to say, well, that's going to be a story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's going to be fun. <laughs> Maybe I'm crazy. Let me, let me ask you, how much time are you facing if all this eight nonsense to ten. goes down? Eight to 10. Eight to and ten. what do you do on that? Yeah. So eight to 10 years in Romania, that'd probably be around five or six years. It's like two thirds. Mm. And uh, Rehova jail is the worst jail in Europe. So Heard that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's overpopulated and... Romanian jail is, is interesting because I wouldn't actually say it's as violent as a Western jail. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I'm wrong, but you see the Western jails is very race segregated and there's drugs mm -hmm. and there's violence. State jails, yeah. State jails. But mm -hmm. Romania doesn't have that because everyone's Romanian. So there's not really a race problem. And they don't really have a problem with foreigners in general. And they know me and my brother inside out. So they know exactly who we are and we're accepted as one of them. So that's mm -hmm. not a problem. The problem with Romanian jail is two things is that one, there's a lot of mental illness because they don't have a segregation between mental illness and crime in the poorer countries. The poorer a country is, the closer it is to your weird jail. They don't have time to deal with the other side of it all. It's very right. expensive and it's very complicated. It's just jail. It's just jail. Yeah. You're, you're, you, oh, you did this, but you're mentally ill. I don't care. You did it, jail. Right. So you have a lot of mental illness and then there's a lot of problem with just the general cleanliness. These jails were built in the communist era. Mm -hmm. They're infected with cockroaches. They've never been fumigated in any way. Mm -hmm. There's, there's insects, there's bed bugs. It's just, it's filthy. This is the big problem with it was the filth. If it wasn't so filthy, it wouldn't be so bad. But mm -hmm. this is what bothered me the most is finding cockroaches in your food and this kind mm -hmm. of thing. But then if I had to choose, would I choose a more violent scenario to avoid the filth? I don't know. If you get stabbed, you're going to wish you didn't. I mean, I slept pretty good in there. People knew who I was and people had a degree of respect. Were you segregated most of the time? Your own cell? Or? Uh, for the, at the beginning, it was me and my brother. We were in separate cells with other people, but then eventually they put us in together because they tapped our cells. So they put us in together mm -hmm. to try and find out and get us talking. Um, and then it became a little bit easier. 
Here is a word from today's sponsor, Aura. If you Google someone, you can find out all kinds of personal information about them. This information is accessible because of data brokers who profit by selling your information to robocallers, telemarketers, spammers. You can use my link, https dot dot forward slash forward slash aura dot com. Aura is A-U-R-A forward slash Sean Atwood, S-H-A-U-N-A-T-T Wood to try two weeks for free and see how many data brokers are sharing your info. Also linked in my description box on this YouTube version or scan the QR code on the screen. Aura also monitors your emails and passwords to see if they were involved in a data breach and exposed on the dark web and gives you the recommendations on what to do. Aura has almost every internet safety tool you'll ever need all inside one app. But I'm looking at eight to 10 years, but I, maybe I'm nuts. Maybe I'm nuts. But in a world where everyone's chasing comfort and I'm chasing challenges, I really do think that that would be a, it'll be a story. I mean, if, okay, if I don't go to, I'm, I'm going to try my very best to not go to jail and I'm innocent. Fine. Of course. Of course. And maybe this is cope. I'm just talking out loud so people can understand my thought process. If you were to ask me in five years from now, let's say I catch three years bid or I don't. Five years from now, what did you do? I flew around on private jets. I went to Italy. I went to Dubai. I drove my fast cars and blah, 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 blah. If I go to jail, the story's different. I, maybe oh, I'm crazy. I don't know. Maybe I'm nuts. But and the, the story is different, but I don't think you need to tell that one. <laughs> and, and, and I'm not, and I'm not wishing for it to happen. Yeah. I'm just trying to explain to people who don't understand why I'm not afraid, mm -hmm. because I know that retrospectively, I won't regret it. At the time I may suffer. Right. I may suffer for a while afterwards, but I like to think, and I hope you can confirm this for me, that you wake up one day and you think back on it and go, yeah, I'm yeah. kind of glad that happened. Yeah. Well, honestly, I spent uh, 29 months in solitary out of my eight years. Wow. And it was probably the best thing that happened to me. Yeah, I mean that, Andrew. Best thing that happened to me because things became very clear. When you're in isolation and you're alone, you can go either way. You could either go crazy like I saw a lot of guys do. Yep. And I don't demean them yep. because isolation is tough. Yep. Those lights go out at night. Sometimes guys can't handle it. You saw a lot of bad stuff. Yep. I get it. Yep. It's tough. I'm dead set against isolation for young people. Yeah. They're young. It's going to be tough for them to survive. But I came out of there a lot clearer on who I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. Yeah. And so that time worked for me. You got to make it work for you. you yeah, of course. You go either way. Of course. And for me, it worked. Yeah. And I, I guess perhaps that's just a general mindset in general. Like if, if, if life gives you lemons, make lemonade, right? Right. I mean, that's, there's, there's two ways you can do it. I also think we're talking about the tenets of masculinity. I think one of the core tenets of masculinity and me personally, I blame myself for everything. I, it's, everything's my fault. It's my fault. If I go to jail, even though I'm innocent, it's still my fault. I ran my mouth the internet. It's my fault. I could have, I could have learned Romanian and defended myself better in court. I didn't. It's my fault. I got to tell you something. I say this all the time. Okay. People ask me, Michael, what's some of your secrets? I said, some of my secrets, one of my main secrets is this, everything that goes wrong in my life I take full responsibility for it. 100%. Because number one, if it was somebody else that did it, I should have known better. Yep. I should have seen it. I should have not let it happen. Yep. When you do, th that's a man, Andrew. When you can take everything on yourself so that the next time you don't make it happen, yep. it's such a benefit and people don't get it. Oh, you know, this guy did me wrong. He did me, yeah, he did. Why did you let him do you wrong? 100%. My fault. I should have seen it. I'm smart enough. I should have known this. I've been through this. If you always take responsibility yourself, you're, you're hundred percent better in life. You can't learn lessons if you're blaming everybody else for what happens to you. Exactly. That's another thing I tell you, I, I, I just cannot stand about our president. The guy never cops to anything. Yeah. Everything is somebody else's fault. It's this, it's that. It wasn't my fault. I did everything right. These are all, I just can't take that in somebody, even with my kids, my son. Well, dad, it wasn't my fault. Yes, it was. Yep. Yes, it was. Even if it wasn't, it's your fault. Because that's how you learn and prevent it. Right. And, and if you have that mentality, it also makes you stronger mentally, I think, to deal with the difficult things in life. Because if you go to jail and you, believe, and you were set up, and a lot of people have, and you're like, oh, the system's wrong, this is wrong, this person lied, I'm a victim, poor me. I don't think that's the right position of strength. I think, the, the, I think you go into jail and go, okay, that's all garbage. Yes, it's a matrix attack, X, Y, Z. However, I could have done this, this, and this, and now it's my chance to do this, this, and this so I don't waste the next few years of my life. And I'm gonna come out and I'm gonna do my very best to be the person I know I can be. And it gives you a degree of fearlessness 
Yeah. It gives you a degree of fearlessness. And that's probably one of the largest problems with society today is that a lot of men have become cowards. They're afraid to talk. I, even us, we talk, it gets us in trouble, right? But every time they mess with us, they damage themselves. One of the overviews, one of the contingents to holding power is that people have to trust you with it. Power, the only guarantee of power, someone said this to me once and I keep saying, I love it. The only guarantee of power is that one day you're gonna lose it. If you have power over a woman and she listens to every word you say, one day she'll stop listening. Might be the same in the mob world. You control the streets. One day you just don't control that street anymore. When you have power, people get power and they never think of this. The only guarantee of it is that one day it's gonna be gone and you have to prepare for that. And one of the quickest ways to lose power is when you can't be trusted with power. We give our governments and these institutions power because we trust them, right? Or the whole world is based on the trust of these systems. As soon as people stop trusting them, they can't do their job anymore. So every single time they do some two-tier policing garbage, every single time they attack somebody purely for their views, like Trump, like you, like I, Mm -hmm. we're like a poison frog and they eat us and they teach us a lesson and we do some jail, that's fine but they get a little bit of poison in them because they instill distrust amongst the populace. It gets to a point where once nobody trusts them at all, then it's over, right? Nobody's going to sit there and go, oh, we'll go to court or I'll wait for court. Once no, once everyone knows it's a scam, yeah. then it's done. So it's kind of like, how do you beat the matrix? How do you defeat the matrix? Well, I'm sitting here running my mouth. They put me in jail for it. I'm now currently on bail and I've been told not to run my mouth and I continue to run my mouth and they'll probably put me in jail. <laughs> and may, maybe I'm martyring myself, but you have to, it, uh, it does do you, damage them. Do you have a gag order on you? I don't have a gag order. I have no official gag order. However, my legal counsel was like, look, you should be careful what you say about Romanian jail and <laughs> Romania yeah. and you're inside Romania and you should be very respectful. And I was like, oh, I am going to be respectful, but I'm also going to tell the truth. Mm-hmm. And They have to damage themselves to do what they're doing. And when people lose faith in these institutions, that's when they're going to have to come along and be honest again. Mm -hmm. Because right now they don't have to be honest at all because there's still a huge percentage of the population. You probably heard this saying, and it's a saying that angers me a lot. Why don't you get a lawyer? (laughs) You ever hear that one? (laughs) It's like, oh, I never thought of trying a lawyer. Oh, a lawyer. Oh, okay, I'll get a lawyer and the law. Oh, fine. I'll go home. It's no problem. It's gone now. (laughs) It's not how it works. It's not how it works. And once people realize that's not how it works on mass, then we're going to have to come into a new system, which I'm hoping we do because the amount of dishonesty that we're operating under now is truly scary. And God's truth is light and sunlight is a disinfectant, but it's, it's actually kind of scary. I think this is one of the reasons why, as well, men are cowards. It's scary to wake up and realize that every single thing you're supposed to believe in is a scam. The mm-hmm. educational system's a scam. The financial system's a scam. The judicial system's a scam. The medical system's a scam. All the wars we went to are scams. Mm-hmm. And when you start to realize, oh, this is all a lie, well, then, then you need bravery, right? So it's easier just to be an ostrich and stick your head in the sand. And then you're going to accept the slave programming because it makes you feel better. And that's just cowardice. And this is what I think we're suffering from massively. We are. And you know another problem, Andrew, I I always said this. It's not strong people you have to worry about. It's weak people that all of a sudden get power. The weak people that get power and don't understand how to use it, and it just, it puffs them up and they think, okay, I'm God now. I'm Godzilla. I can do anything I want. And that's, those are the people that you have to worry about. It's like a drug they're not used to. Exactly. If you're a powerful person, you go through life and you've always been treated with a degree of respect and you have a degree of respect back. But if you're the kind of person who's never been respected and you get some power, you're evil. You're evil. You you literally become a psychopath. You're evil. You cannot trust weak people with power, absolutely. And that's what's so scary because I guess in the hierarchies of old, up until very modern times, it would be extremely difficult for a weak person to obtain power. No. But now we have these hierarchies where everything's so messed up and turned on its head where the only people in power are weak. Well, that's it, because we, we have a generation of weak people that are now getting power, and that's the problem. And also, when a weak man can be... See, anyone who does not understand that they're attacking Trump because he's a good guy has a mental deficiency. That, it's very simple. You don't have to agree with all of his policies. There's some things he says I don't personally agree with. Fine, who cares? Of course. Of course. He's, you don't have to agree with everything. The point is, they're attacking him because he's on the good team. Because the reason they like weak people in power is because weak people can be intimidated and scared. 
which is why they want them to be in power. So when they go to these backdoor meetings, people walking into rooms and saying things, they comply with the true masters and they work for the person they're supposed to work for, which is to globalize finance and not their contingency, not their constituency. That's what they want. So having weak leaders is dangerous because weak people do the most evil because they're too scared to stand up. They're too scared to stand up and fight against evil. It's really interesting that the world is so brutally simple. And truthfully, a lot of it comes down to the capability or at least the propensity or at least a lack of fear of violence. I was having a conversation with uh, a girl and she was saying that, you know, oh, men like wars, men go to wars. I was like, oh yeah, it's all men's fault. Men go to wars. Okay. You don't understand the world very much, but the world is war. Everything is war. And the reason you get to drive around in your little Mercedes and live in a peaceful society is because there's an underpinning of violence everywhere. Everyone understands that if they do certain things, it eventually will end up in a violent scenario. If you speed on the highway and they give you a ticket and you don't pay the ticket and they add more money and you don't pay it and they tell you to go to court and you don't go. And then they come and say, come to go to court and you say, no, they'll come to arrest you. And you say, I don't want to be arrested. And then eventually violence. We have all this paperwork on top mm -hmm. and we have all these nice facade, but when it gets down to it, it ends up in violence. It doesn't matter if it's the legal system or your life. I'm sure you try and talk to somebody and. I don't want to get in while. trouble. <laughs> yeah. It all ends up in violence. This is the underpinning. And when you have men who are afraid of violence, then they're always going to have the opinion they're told to have. They'll say two plus two is five. And if you say it's four, we're going to fight. If you're scared of a fight, well, then two plus two is five. Mm -hmm. And a fight doesn't mean win. It means fight. Fight means fight. Yeah, right. I can't win when the police raid my house. I mean, I could try and win and get in a shootout and die mm -hmm. if, if that would be beneficial to me in any way. But I'm not scared to get my ass kicked. <laughs> maybe, I'm, maybe that's the difference. Come, mm -hmm. put me in jail then. And if you have enough people who aren't scared of even just losing a fight, you can win the fight. Mm -hmm. But we have so many people who are scared of fighting at all. The number of people who were saying, yeah, I know it's a scam, but why is there a but? You know, it's a, that's, that's it. You know, it's a scam. That's the beginning and end to me. And, and I was perhaps, now I think back, I was perhaps too risky during that period because I was nuts from day one before we even knew it was a scam. I was ready. If it was real, I'd be dead. I'd be the first guy to have died. Number one, I got on a plane here in an empty airport on an empty plane, the last plane out of Romania and flew to Sweden, which was wide open mm -hmm. and never closed nothing. And I'm running around Swedish nightclubs with champagne like an idiot. So if it was real, I'd be dead on the ground. I'd be the dead, first dead guy. Luckily, it turned out to be a scam, so I looked like a genius. So perhaps I was too brave. Perhaps I should have waited a while. But for three years, they got away with that because a bunch of people were like, yeah, you know, but I don't want to lose my job or I don't want to get in trouble or what if the police knock on my door or what if, what if, what if, what if. Let them. Let them show their hypocrisy. If enough of you stand up and make them, they can't arrest everybody. They can't, they can't do it to everybody. If you, there has to come a point in society where you sit and say, we know this is garbage. And this is what's actually most scary about America now because I think America this year is going to be telling for, it's going to go down in history as a pivotal point in, Amer in, in, in the empire of America because empires raise and empires fall. They, they brutalized the January Sixers. They got wrecked in courts. They brutalized them. There's people in jail now. Oh, they yeah. haven't even been charged yet. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're a and grandma. Been sitting in there for three years. Yeah, you're a grandma and you turn up with a flag at your own Capitol building. You don't even go yeah. inside. And you don't even hear about it because the news won't report the it. News won't report There's it. people in jail there that haven't even been charged with a crime for three years. Correct. They've been brutalized. Brutalized. Did at, nothing. Did nothing. And they're showing, ah, if you try and complain when we rig an election, this is what's going to happen to you. Well, that to me shows intent to rig elections. Perhaps I'm crazy. That's a pretty logical explanation, pretty logical conclusion. And we're getting there now. And they're trying everything they can do. So what happens? This is what's going to be interesting. This is going to go down in future when they discuss societal reactions, right? Everybody knows if they rigged this election. Everybody knows if Trump doesn't win, it's rigged. They also know if you go on the street, you're in trouble. Are you going to do it? Or are you going to let them have it? They're going to let them have it. And that's the end of the American empire. That's right. And that this is it. The cowardice is all they need. They've done their bit. They've shown their lesson. And there's not enough people who say, Fuck it, lock me up. You can't lock us all up. You can't lock up a million of us. People are too scared. 
So they're going to go away. They're going to get it. And then you know what you're going to see? Now, this is going to break my heart. You're going to see a whole bunch of tough talk on Twitter. From yes. A bunch of, yeah, da, 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 a bunch of words. See a bunch of Republicans. I'm going to go to the House and I'm going to make this bill and we're going to investigate. And then nothing happens. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, 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 blah. Nothing happens. Yeah. We remember this whole uh, impeachment of Biden? Oh, yeah. All of a sudden, you don't hear. Last six weeks, I haven't heard a thing. I've had three racketeering cases. Three. Two federal, one state. The evidence that's been brought about already on both Bidens, him and his son, that's a racketeering indictment without a doubt. 100%. Without a doubt. There isn't even a doubt. Yep. Now, whether he gets convicted or not, that's all. I always believe you're innocent until proven guilty. You yep. get your day in court. Yep. But can he be indicted? 1,000%. It's not even a close call. Of course. You got suspicious bank records. You got $20 million going into his family's accounts. Yep. What product did they sell? Yep. What service did they provide? Nothing. It was influence peddling. Yep. 100%. This guy's a traitor. Yep. He's treasonous. He's a traitor. And he's the president of my country. And this is what's getting me. And people don't see it. They don't see it. 47 years, this guy's been living off the taxpayer money. Never had a job in his life. Yep. Wealthy guy. Robbing from everybody, which, okay, you want to rob money? Go ahead. Rob money. Yep. Do, do what you got to do. But now get out of here. Yeah. You're destroying our country. You're destroying the whole world. Yep. This world is ca in chaos because of our president. Yep. I, I, there would be no wars. If Trump was there, there would be no wars. We wouldn't have a problem in the Middle East. We'd have a problem anyway. I guarantee it. Well, this, this is the thing. Because Trump, people respect. And this also ties back. It's kind of amazing how you can tie anything from a governmental level just to the, the basics of life. I didn't have to fight in jail because they knew I could fight. Done. Exactly. Just, you, uh, you, 100%. <laughs> you just said it. Trump, no one wants to smoke. No. Biden's weak. So that's why the world's a mess. DeSantis in, you know, DeSantis in Florida, mm -hmm. you know, they're having trouble with, with colleges all over the country. He said, very simple. We're not going to have it here. You do that, you're going to jail. Yep. End of it. Fixed it. That's it. Done. Yep. This doesn't take years. It doesn't take any amount of brilliance. Just fix it. Done. Fast. And, and this is the problem with, with, with cowardice and with weakness. And it's kind of interesting because I study the fall and ri the rise and fall of empires and no empire lasts forever. And bef there, before the American empire was the British empire and before that was the Dutch empire. And they all kind of end the same way. Yeah. The Roman empire is one that everyone studied and understands. And you look at the fall of the Roman empire and it's not that complicated. The, the, the population became decadent. The men didn't want to fight anymore. When the barbarians would come, they'd say, ah, oh, we don't want to fight you. We'll let you in. You can be Roman too. Everyone got addicted to this idea of just getting slaves, whether sexual <laughs> slaves or slaves, they could sit around and do nothing. So they just let the barbarians in and hired them as slaves, cheap workers. They inflated the currency. And eventually it just all collapses on itself. It can't last for long. Sounding familiar, right? It now. sounds pretty, familiar. it sounds pretty familiar. Yes. And, and, and this is the thing that people don't understand when they look at, you know, if I had to be optimistic, let me try and be optimistic for once in my life. So are you a pessimistic guy? I don't think I'm a pessimistic person, but I am a realist. Mm -hmm. And if you're realistic, I'm a realist, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I had a tweet that I put up a little while ago and I said, if, if, I, if I walked into a room and someone gave me a million dollars, I wouldn't smile or get happy or laugh. I'd wonder if I can get to the car park alive. <laughs> That's just my brain. I'd be like, a million dollars, thank you. Why? Oh, we really like you, Andrew. Like, okay. I like you too. Hmm. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm a pessimist. Even a million dollars will make me worry. I don't yeah. know. But um, when you, when you, if, you want, if I want to be optimistic, I think if you want to try and explain the matrix or why these things are happening to the layperson, I don't think they understand that if you get enough money and enough capital, you're no longer tied geographically to anywhere. You can go anywhere. I'm in Romania. I'm not Romanian. And I can live on any country in the world. I can go to the Philippines or Japan tomorrow. I can pay a lawyer to give me my residency and I can buy a nice big house and I can live there. Mm -hmm. So you don't have the same vested interest in a local area, right? So if, if you have a decision to make, which will allow you to make forever profit, but it may detriment a certain area for, it allows you to make 5% more profit but it'll increase the crime rate in a certain town by 0.6% because people are coming in who no one knows who they are. You may not be evil, but you're kind of just like, mm, oh, I get to make more money and I don't live in that town anyway. And if mm -hmm. I don't do it, my competitor is going to do it. And we're trying to compete with China and we need the cheap workers and ah, okay. 
And there's a lot of that going on as well. People just, a bunch of small decisions compounding on top of each other. And before you know it, you have towns or states or districts or areas that are completely wrecked by people making decisions to benefit themselves, to make money, and they just simply move and leave. If you don't have geographical freedom in the world today, and to have geographical freedom, you need to have financial freedom, you're in trouble because you're living in an area that you don't have any control or influence over. And there's a whole bunch of people trying to extract as much money as possible from that area. They don't consider your point of view. They don't consider your life. It doesn't matter to them. How can I make as much money as possible? If Ford can make a bunch of money building its cars in China, it will do exactly that and Detroit will suffer. They don't care. You're stuck in Detroit. That's your problem. Right. So you need to have geographical freedom and you need to have financial freedom. And I, I tell these things and people say to me, but not everyone can do that. Correct. That's what's even harder about the world. Mm -hmm. Not everybody can pull it off. Mm -hmm. It becomes even more difficult. And this is the situation we're in. And then you, the answer, of course, is politics, to elect somebody who cares about you. And we've been down the path of where that leads. Find somebody. Yep. Yeah. We've been down the path of where that leads. So the American experiment is interesting. There was also a book by a Scottish doctor. I've not read the whole book, and I can't remember his name, so I can't credit him. But he talked about the rise and fall of democracies. And very simply to the rise and fall of empires, he said that you have a king and you have a good one and you build a strong nation and then you have a king and he's an idiot and then you don't want him anymore and you want the people to have a decision. So you start a democracy and then people vote in somebody who's probably good the first time around. And over time, democracy becomes decadent and all becomes corrupt and financially led. And it gets to the end of democracy and then people want a king again. Anyone with a functioning brain would allow, would say Trump forever president. Sure. Do a Putin. Stay in, stay in charge as long as you can. Anyone with a brain would say that to, right now. Mm -hmm. Everybody would. We'd all go back to a king tomorrow. Exactly. So the democracy falls and you try and go back to a king and eventually another king comes. No one likes him, goes back to the democracy. The world is so cyclical. And I guess with an understanding of this, you can also understand the beauty of life because good times don't last forever. Neither do the bad times. Mm -hmm. It's all going to, it's going to come, it's going to go. And you just have to be ready to ride the storm and enjoy it for what it is. And, and maybe when you go truly crazy, you can enjoy the bad times as much as you can enjoy the good times because there's no light without dark. I don't, I don't know about you, but my brother and I, our best stories are being broke. In fact, being rich has only has any value at all because we were broke. If I buy a Lamborghini, I don't care. But if I buy a Lamborghini and then laugh about how I didn't have a car, now I want the car. There's no light without dark. There's no, there's no joy without pain. I can't, the, sooner or later, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, tomorrow, who knows, I'm going to be free from this place and I'm going to enjoy my freedom again. When I was free, yeah. Mm. That's the beauty of life, isn't it? Yeah, no, you're right. And, 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 and I think with that understanding, you no longer fear the bad things. And then when you don't fear bad things, you can find something to stand up for and something to believe in. And if men would do that, it would fix a lot of the problems. I blame all of society's problems on men. I'm a misogynist, but I blame the men personally. Uh, call me a misogynist, but I think it's all the men's fault because the men are the protectors and you're supposed to protect a society and prevent this from happening by hook or by crook. So I was in Moldova, which is a country next door to here. They have an interesting history. They were mm -hmm. uh, a communist state, communist state, and then the USSR fell and it's a small country and they had a war in 1992 or something, a small war trying to decide if they wanted to be more Romanian influenced or more Russian influenced. Nobody talks about this war, but they speak Russian and Romanian. They're kind of stuck between the two countries, but it's a very poor nation in Moldova. Mm -hmm. And I was there five or six years ago. And my brother and I were there and we're in a nightclub and we're having fun, we're partying, whatever, whatever. What I was doing in there, I don't even know. I think back, it was very immature, very, very, very silly of me. How old were you? 32, 31. So I'm not even that, not even that young. Not, I, was, I was old enough to know better. It's right. a dangerous place. And we're there and we're partying and whatever. And we had these three or four girls we met and we left the club with them and we were walking down the street. And then these 10 Russian guys started screaming in Russian at the girls. And we're like, what are they saying? And the girls started running their mouths back in Russian. And me and Tristan are standing there saying, what's going on? Mm. The guys start walking towards us. Me and T look at each other like, okay, we're in a bit of trouble here. We're going. Yeah. And the guy comes up and he goes, uh, you come for bang, bang? You come for bang, bang? I'm like, what? And throws a punch and smacks Tristan clean in the mm. face. And then the other guy goes to punch me. I move. I grab him by the jacket. And I'm holding this one guy and the other nine are running over. And Tristan wobbles, but he's okay. And I, I pushed him back and we both ran off in the other direction. We were outnumbered 15 to one, maybe. 15 mm -hmm. to two. It was crazy. 
The girls started screaming, whatever. We only backed up. We didn't run far. We ran like five or six meters and we stood there now and we're facing all 15 of these men. And my brother, who must be insane, says, girls, <laughs> he still wants the girl. <laughs> and the girls walk over and these guys are all talking in Russian and arguing with us, whatever. The girls come, we go get in the taxi. That was the end of the, the whole story. And I said to the girls in the taxi, like, what was that about? What happened? And she's like, oh, they were screaming in Russian. They were calling us names. They were saying we're sluts and we're whores. And I was like, why? Because we're with foreign men and they say that, you're, that we're only with you because you're rich and you only came here for beautiful women. I mean, Tristan, we're like, the, the thing is, the point I'm trying to make is, I actually, as crazy as it sounds, although they just hit my brother, hit me, I understood them. I know that sounds nuts, but the nationalistic view of them was, there's no reason for American men to be here and those women like his money. So why, are they, why is this even happening? I earn 200 bucks a month. No. Now that's too extreme. That's why Moldova is a poor country. That's why foreigners can't go there. Mm -hmm. Fine. That's too extreme. But the point I'm trying to make, the meta point is, the masculine imperative inside of them thought, this is bad for society. This is my country. What is going on here? They're chasing his money. He wants the beautiful women. What is this going on? What, why is this happening here? What is all of this? They were drunk, they were angry, and something happened. Mm. We don't want that, of course. Right. That's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is that the general masculine theme is protection and protectiveness. But you can't be protective anymore. Because if you are protective, they hit you with a weaponized virtue. If you're protective of your children, you're homophobic. If you're protective of your nation, you're racist. If you're protective of your religion, I don't even know what they're going to call you. There must be some ism for that. If you try and do anything, if you love anything, you're hateful. This is the PSYOP. Mm -hmm. And people are scared of being called hateful all the time. They're scared of it. I guess, I think one of the reasons they're so angry with me is because I lean into it. They're like, you're a misogynist. Yep. I'm, I'm done arguing with these clowns because they refuse to listen to reason. And anyone with a brain knows the truth. And anyone who's stupid is going to believe what they say anyway. I'm like, yeah, I'm the worst misogynist in the world. I'm a terrible person. Next. Well, let me ask you a question. You got a, a legion of young men that are following you now, and you're teaching them basically how to be men. Yeah. Right? You think this is what they're after you for? I, I think that's primarily why they're after me, yes. I think that's what they're afraid of. I would argue that if I was in charge of a government, my number one concern would be psyoping the masculine youth because that's the revolution. If women get angry, that's fine, but it's eventually gonna come down to men being angry because the world comes down to violence. So they have to try very hard to psyop the masculine youth to one, not cause a revolution, and two, the masculine youth have the worst life. I would argue that young men today have a worse life than even young women, and they have all of their own problems. I'm not saying their problems don't exist, but for the average young man today, Women expect him to be a millionaire at 20, which he isn't. Nobody gives a shit about his opinion at all. He can kill himself, nobody cares. He isn't born with any innate value because he's not beautiful like a woman is. So he has to build himself from the ground up. He has no teachers in any way. No one really to teach him. There's people like us on the internet, fine, but everyone around him is gonna convince him that we're bad people. Everything he's being told in regards to his natural feelings, his natural instincts and inclinations he's being told makes him a bad person, makes him toxic for feeling like a man in any way. It's very hard to be a young man today and they feel disenfranchised with the system. So they find solutions, the, the human mind looks for solutions, they start listening to me and they go, oh, I feel better if I do this. I feel better if I go to the gym. I feel better if I start to take responsibility and take accountability and I, I feel better if I'm not afraid of pain anymore. I feel better if I'm not afraid of suffering. I feel better if I understand that I'm supposed to suffer that that's what's gonna make me the best person that I could possibly be. That my youth is supposed to be spent doing difficult things so that I have the light and the dark. They find me and they start to feel a certain way about it. And then they reject the matrix programming. And before you know it, which was even a surprise to me, what I said earlier on today, I'm being discussed in parliament as a national security threat because, I, because the, the masculine youth don't wanna to listen to the garbage they're being told anymore. And it's all my fault. And, and then you get down to a really, a really crazy level, a real scary level, because once you're a national security threat, all bets, all bets are off at that point. When I was in jail, there was a huge protest organized. 200,000 people were gonna protest in London. And from my jail phone, I said, don't, don't do it. Because if they start breaking windows, if they start doing, I'm never getting out. I'm, they're gonna keep me there. Because they're gonna say, look what Andrew Tate did. Mm -hmm. and, and this is again, how unfair the system is, right? Because when you're large online, millions of people listen to you. Millions of people listen to me. 
but they make you responsible for every single person who's ever listened, especially if that person does something wrong. If, if I speak and 10 million people listen and one of them's an idiot, one of them's a moron and goes and does something stupid, they're going to say, I made a new it. You. Now, if, if I listen to a Taylor Swift CD and then kill myself, they're not going to say Taylor Swift made me kill myself. No, of course, because she's on their team. Right. But if you're not on their team, you're responsible for everything bad that's ever happened with your name even remotely connotated. I've had people tweet at me saying, oh, we found this guy and he killed his girlfriend and he followed you on Twitter. I'm like, 9.1 million people oh, follow me on Twitter and I don't know who they are. What does that have to do with me? Am I responsible now? And they want you to self-censor. They want you to be so afraid of this attack that you don't say anything which could ever possibly be misconstrued. The truth is about speech and human language is that everything can be misconstrued. Drink water. It's good for you. If you don't, you'll die. Drink too much, you drown. If I say drink water and someone drowns, it's my fault. I'm a bad person. Mm -hmm. You can't win this game. Right. You can't win this game. And this is how they attack. And I think that a lot of my worldviews, a lot of my... I do, I do think that the human mind finds cope. I do think the human mind adopts a framework which allows them to exist inside of their reality most comfortably. But a lot of my frameworks and a lot of the reason I come to the conclusions I come to when I say like life is constant and endless wars because I believe there's nothing I can do that's going to make any of these people happy besides die or shut up. And then you have to make a decision if you're going to do that. Is there anything they could do to make you shut up? No, and you've reached that point now where there's nothing, nothing you could do that's going to change anybody at this point. Nothing. And, 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 and even if they were to come to you right now, I mean, I don't know how they could possibly try. If they were to come to you and say, Michael, please keep doing your podcast, but don't, don't talk about the presidency. Da, 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 and, uh, is there anything they could do that would make you shut up? Andrew, I'll tell you, uh, six years ago, I wrote a book. It was a business book. I owed, the, I owed my publisher another book. Book did well. Yeah. So I go there. They say, we want you to do a political book. I said, okay. So what are you going to call it? <laughs> I said, it, it's just like this, what are you going to call it? I didn't even think. I said, mafia democracy. Well, what do you mean? I said, our government is a mafia now. Gee. You guys cleaned it up off the street. Now they're in Washington. 100%. Okay, great. They give me a big advance. I go home. I start writing a book. I get into like four chapters, five chapters. I turn to my wife. I say, why am I doing this? They're not bothering me. They're leaving me alone. I says, this is real stuff. People are going to get upset with me. I went back to my publisher. I gave him back the advance. I said, not doing this, right? Cut to two years ago. I said, I have responsibility to do this. I can't shut up. I see what these people are doing. Yeah. They're liars. They're thieves. They're hypocrites. I can't do it. I go and write the book. I call it Mafia Democracy. Andrew, lay everything out exactly how I could see in a second exactly what they did. It's all about money and power. Yeah. I see what they're doing, right? I write the book, book's a huge success. People come in, now we see it, now we get it, now we understand what they're doing. And I'm going right down the middle. Democrat, Republican, this is the system that we've created now. Yep. You got a bunch of weak people in office that are bleeding you dry, yep. you know? But people don't understand, they're raising taxes. What do you mean raising taxes? Everything we do is taxed. Right. Everything from the clothes we wear to the food we eat to the car we drive to the insurance we get to our health, everything is taxed. Yep. Don't you understand this? They raise it. All they do is tax us. But this is the system now. But they don't live the same way. These people are wealthy. They don't know that you're going to the grocery store and paying 20, 30, 40, 50 percent more because they don't do that. And they don't care. And they don't care about you. You think they care. And if they're paying, they're paying you with your own money. They're charging you more and then try, you don't even understand the system. Yep. You know, so what's the cure? Vote these people out of office. Yep. Get rid of them. Don't let them lie to you. Don't let, they, you know how many people die? Listen, I'm saying this, I get in trouble. Our president has blood on his hands. Yep. Andrew, if you know human trafficking is coming over the border, real human Yep. Not the BS with you. Real human is coming over that border. Opioids and f coming over the border. You know, I was at, uh, I saw the Border Patrol agents. They showed me a, f a block of f uh, a, maybe three times the size of this. Mm -hmm. They said, Michael, this can kill the entire world population. Wow. It's coming over the border and we can't stop it. You know this? You're the president of the United States. You know this and you don't close the border immediately? I had a kid drop dead in my house. He had a, a bit of this big, like a, a drop of a pin, a pinhead, within 10 minutes, dead in my house. Insane. You know this is happening, and you don't put a stop to it. You know there's human
You're in charge of this whole country, the welfare of people that trusted you and put you in office. You don't stop it immediately. What more evidence do you need? And this, and, and this is where the whole conversation gets spiritual because- But, but you, see, you see, but then they get mad at us for talking about it because it's the truth and they can't accept that. That's right. You they know? want to but, shoot the messenger. No. Yeah. You know, but how do, you, how do you just sit there and say, well, you know what, my life is good. I'm just going to keep quiet. I can't do it. Because you'd have to be soulless to do yeah, it. I can't do it. This is the reason why they try and convince the whole population they're depressed. Depression is a low energy state. You're not going to go to revolution if you're depressed. If you're depressed, you're obsessed only with how you feel. You're self-obsessed now. You're a depressed person. You don't want to go outside. You don't want to do anything. You don't care about the world. Right. You only care about you. You're worshiping Satan if you're going to sit there depressed. I, I don't care if I'm depressed. I have things to do. And I am not going to allow people I care about to be at detriment. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'm a full grown man. I have things to do. So they're trying to push all of this and it is demonic and it's satanic. And once you go down this rabbit hole, it's amazing. You can start with fiat currency or you can start with the false democracy. You can start with all these things. It has to end up at God because there has to be an equal and opposite force. There's so much evil in the world. There has to be an equal and opposite force, which is God. And the only thing that can actually fix a society and maintain a society is the belief in something bigger and more powerful than a government mm -hmm. or money is God. And this is why you look at this, the countries who have thrown God away, how quickly they're declining, as opposed to the countries who still have God and still believe in God. And, and this is why it's such an important, it's a spiritual battle. It truly is spirit. It's good against evil. It's that simple. 100%. It, it, it's, it's good people against evil 100%. people. And another thing that's always given me comfort is, you understand that truthfully all you own is your soul anyway. I mean, I, I can tell you from experience and you probably know better than me. You don't own that card. You don't own that house. You don't own the money in that bank. Piss off the government and you will see how quickly you don't own a thing. Right. A judge who you've never heard of will stamp a piece of paper you've never read and you are on your ass. That's it. You don't own anything besides how you feel when you look in the mirror. That's all you own. The rest of it is garbage. You own your body, perhaps, if you don't let them inject you with anything. And you own your soul if you get to stand up for what you believe in and what you say. I get to look in the mirror and go, yeah, maybe I got myself in trouble, but I meant what I said. I meant every word I have ever said, even if now I retrospectively disagree with some of the things I've said because I've grown as a person. At the time, I meant it, and I meant what I said, and I said it. It is what it is. You can take my cars, you can take my house, you can take all my money. doesn't matter. Because that's what you truly own. They have people so obsessed with this idea of owning this garbage they don't own anyway. That, and that's the thing, because that's how they force you to comply, right? If you tell too much truth on Twitter, you lose your job, you lose your job, you lose your mortgage. Can't pay the house, mm -hmm. you lose everything, right? So they have people self-obsessed with all of these unimportant things that they don't even really even own. Yeah, you're right. And <laughs> this is where spirituality is so important. I find it heartbreaking that America, which is supposed to be the largest and most powerful Christian country, Christian, right? you will get more respect for George Floyd than Jesus Christ. I find it heartbreaking that you can mock Jesus in the open. Yeah. I find, I find it, yeah, free speech, blah, blah, blah. There's free speech, but no, I don't think you should be walking around insulting the God of the country you live in. You can't do that in an Islamic country. You can't do that in, in nearly any religion's country. Only in these first world Christian nations that they're gonna allow their prophets to be mocked and say, ah, well, no, oops. They'll put up satanic statues in churches. Yeah, they did this. Fine. And the guy, a Christian, destroyed the statue. He got charged. Yeah. He right. got charged. Andrew, it's happening every day in America. Every you could tell you, God forbid you say something against a transsexual. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. That's that's the re, that's the real religion. Absolutely. But talk about Jesus, talk about God, nobody cares. That's right. The real religion are is is LGBT. You can't yeah. destroy that flag. Can't destroy it. You can't you can't talk bad about that. That's become a religion. You're right. It is. They they make it sacred. It absolutely. You have your priests and priestesses. You have your religious doctrine. And they're trying to convince everybody to join. You know, what they want is they want machines in charge of everything. They want AI to come along. They want robots in charge. They want a slave class of people below the robots. And they want to tell the robots what to do. Things are bad enough now. Imagine when the police force is robotic. Yeah. Now, what are you yeah. going to do then? Terminator, Skynet. It's coming. It's coming. It's, coming. It, it's, it's going to be over for humanity. We're in a large last period where people can stand up and say, we will not accept. And they're still sitting there going, ah, maybe it'll be okay. It's not going to be okay if you don't do anything about it. It's funny because you talk about God. One of the guys I live with is a very devout Christian. 
We talk about which, which you once were, right? Well, I, I was an atheist. Okay. And then I, I educated myself mm -hmm. and then I was a Christian for a while, but I think I reverted to that because I was raised Christian. So I was like, I believe in God again, so I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. And then I read the Bible and then I read the Quran and then I found an affinity with Islam. And it's a very interesting conversation because in a lot of ways they're a lot more similar than people realize. They're actually very similar, but I don't feel qualified to discuss Islam like that because it's a very complicated religion and I'm a revert. I'm only two years in and I'm learning. But one of the guys who lives with me is a devout Christian and we often have these conversations and we talk about these things. And your brother's a Christian. My brother's a Christian, that's right. And he says, when we talk about these things, he goes, ah, Jesus is coming back. It's fine. Jesus is coming back. So I'm like, but Christian nations need to stand up for themselves and you need to do something, you need to fight. And he goes, ah, but Jesus is coming back. And I said, I don't prescribe to that particular mentality. And it reminds me of a story from my dad. Well, let me ask you a question. When you say you don't prescribe to that mentality, do you not believe Jesus is coming back or you just don't believe in that mentality you just described? I, I do believe, let's say I believe Jesus was coming back. That wouldn't mean I don't take action. That wouldn't mean I just wait. I agree with that. I don't agree with the, it's going to be fine. It'll be fixed no, by Jesus. No. I'll give you a quick example. My, my father was a world class chess player. He was a professional chess player. I used to go with him to chess tournaments. We were at a chess tournament. I think we were in Chicago, Illinois, and I must've been about eight years old. And uh, Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan grandmaster turned up and he looked visibly shaken. And it's a, he's from Azerbaijan, so he was mm -hmm. not used to driving on ice. And he came in and he looked visibly shaken and my dad and his friends were standing there, all the chess players, and he said, what's the matter? And he goes, God just saved my life, God just saved my life. And we were like, what happened? He said, I was driving on the bridge and I lost control on the ice and I was heading towards the edge of the bridge and I, I, the car wasn't responding and I just closed my eyes and I prayed to God and I opened my eyes and I stopped just before I went off the bridge. I, I, I broke the barrier, I nearly went off the bridge. God saved my life, God saved my life. And I remember my dad said, maybe God saved your life, but I wouldn't have taken my hand off the wheel. Mm -hmm. And that was his mentality. And, and, and I remember him saying, I was only eight. Mm -hmm. I remember him saying that and walking off. And I talked to him about it on the way home. What does that mean? He goes, well, God has a plan. That's great. But I'm going to do my very best while I'm here. And God will allow me to either succeed or he won't. So we could sit here and say, Jesus is coming back to save Christian nations. Yeah, perhaps. Perhaps you should stop letting yourself get punked all day and stand up and do something. Perhaps. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. But it truly breaks my heart when these things are happening. Well, no, you're right. Because faith without works is not, it's meaningless. But let me ask you a very interesting, because you said you believe Jesus is coming back, yeah. and yet you're Islam. So does Islam. They do. Yeah. So they believe that Jesus is the son of God. Yeah. Okay. They believe he was a messenger. They don't believe he's the son of God. I have to be, I, I, I don't want to say anything incorrect, because if I say anything incorrect, the, the Muslim world jumps all over me. But they do believe he was a messenger. They believe he was a prophet, mm -hmm. along with Muhammad and along with Moses. They believe in a lot of the same things. I guess the very simplistic way to understand or explain Islam is they believe in the Bible. They believe in all of it. They just wrote one more book afterwards by one more messenger, Muhammad, peace be upon him. And in his book, he said, Christians are right. Everything's right. But there's also this part. That's the very simplistic view of it. Mm -hmm. It's, I don't think the problem is Islam versus Christian. I don't think the problem is God versus God. I think the main problem with the world today is godless versus believers. I think if you have somebody who believes in God, all the religions have a basic tenet of look after your family, yeah. do the right thing. God is watching. There is sin. There are some things more important than money. You know, like in Islam, we don't have uh, ursary, for example. There's no interest allowed. It says in the Quran, if you have a society based on interest and based on debt and based on banking, you're going to be controlled by evil. It says in the Quran, in the 14th century. So like there's certain, it has, you have spiritual beliefs. And if you don't have any spiritual belief, you're only going to worship money. There's nowhere else to go, right? And if you worship money, you're corruptible. So I think that people who are spiritual as opposed to people who are atheistic is the main problem because the atheists aren't even atheistic. They worship LGBT, money, government, feminism, abortion, whatever insanity. They have their religions. They're just evil. So there's no such thing as an atheist anyway. They just have completely insane religions. Right. I believe that people who believe in God versus people who don't is the main problem. I think a lot of the confusion, though, about Islam is a lot of the problems in the Western world are from migrants, perhaps, or from people who are from Islamic countries. 
so people have a problem with Islam, which I can understand. But I would argue that the problem there is not Islam. The problem is third worlders versus first worlders. Some of the first world Islamic nations are the most beautiful places on earth. Bahrain, Kuwait, Dubai, United Arab Emirates. These are gorgeous places with no crime. And, and you're going to see with no tax and the tallest buildings in the world, mm -hmm. perfect roads, 0% tax rate. No tax. Yeah, no tax. Explain that government. Mm -hmm. And they built these beautiful places and everyone's safe and society functions and everything's gorgeous. Obviously, you have third world Islamic nations with problems. You can go to Africa and find third world Christian nations. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and you will see how they treat women. People say, oh, Islam's bad to women. We'll see how they treat women in Africa and Christian nations. You're, so you're right. It, it's third world versus first world. Let me ask you, is there a reason you were drawn more to Islam than Christianity? <clears throat> I don't, I read both books. I don't know if it was my time inside of his in, in Islamic countries. I felt God. I felt it. I don't know how else to say it. I felt, I felt it. I felt it more when I went to the mosque. I felt it when I was in an Islamic country. I felt it. And, and I've analyzed this about myself heavily because I believe that feedback is how you get good at anything. Mm -hmm. Practice is, people think practice makes perfect. That's a lie. Feedback makes perfect. And I was actually discussing this with somebody who was talking about my podcast. He says, oh, your podcasts are very good. And how do you talk so well? And I said, well, he goes, you must be practicing. I said, I don't practice because I'm 37, you're 42. You've been practicing longer than me. So how come I can speak better than you can? Because <laughs> I watch myself back and I analyze, I learn new words, I right. feedback. Feedback is how you get good at something. Mm -hmm. So I try to analyze my own state of mind all the time. And I try and work out why did I feel like an Islamic society was closer to God than a Christian society? Is it because of what's in the book? Or is it because of the society I'm in? Is it because of the society? Maybe, and I'm just being perfectly brutally honest here. Maybe when I look at religion, I say, well, if a religion, what's the primary goal of a religion? Is it to save souls? Yes. But also, wouldn't you argue the primary goal of religion is to preserve a society to a degree? If, if, an, if Islam can preserve Islamic societies, if women are women, if men are men, if even in war zones, even, even you can look at the worst countries on the planet today, they're Islamic countries, if they're still all praying, they're still all with their wives, they're still all feeding, God is the only thing they've got. They don't have anything else. They're not afraid to die for what they believe in. God is all they've got left. You know, what's interesting. Someone said to me, they said, imagine when you look at movies and you see a post-apocalyptic Christian country, like, you know, something's happened. You see riots, you see uh, looting, you see all these things, right? Mm -hmm. He goes, there's a bunch of Islamic countries right now that are already post-apocalyptic. You don't see any of that because they believe in God. Maybe it's that. Maybe it's just, I felt it hold society together. And, and I, I'm not going to sit here and argue that I'm right. I'm not going to argue against Christianity at all. I respect Christianity. I was raised Christian. I have absolute respect for Christians. My brother's a Christian. I'm not going to sit and say that I'm right and anyone else is wrong. I'm just saying perhaps it's as simple as if I send my children to school in Dubai, 99% of the problems we've talked about, I don't have to worry about anymore. Maybe yeah. it's that simple. It's like, okay, boom. Let, let me tell you the one, the one thing that separates Christianity that's scary to everything else on earth, in my view. If Christians are right, and the only way to get to heaven, which I know you believe in, yeah. we believe in heaven and hell, is through Jesus Christ, yeah. then every other religion could be good. There's no question about that. But the separation is that if you don't believe Jesus is the son of God, that's right. then you don't get to heaven. That's right. And that's scary. Yeah. And you know, when I was in the hole, um, I, I, um, I kind of challenged God at that moment, you know, because my wife was Christian, my mother-in-law Christian, they were telling me, and I didn't have time for that. But now I'm getting in there, and you know what I developed, Andrew? I developed a healthy fear of hell. Yeah. You're in the hole. If this is it, if this is the rest of eternity like this, only a million times worse, and even if it isn't worse, this is it. Yeah. I'm here alone by myself, separated from everyone I love, and this is it, eternal nothing. I said, I need to find out what's true. And at that point in time, I had my Bible in there. I had my wife send me every book you can imagine, Christian faith, Hindu, Muslim, everything. I was reading everything. And for me, the separation was, okay, all of this makes sense. But if Jesus is the only way to heaven and I reject that, then no matter how good I am, no matter what else I do, I'm going nowhere. This is going to be eternity for That's me. Right. So this is the separation. And I think 
people have to make that choice. It's it's a super interesting conversation, and I'm I can't wait. I'd love for us to do a podcast in a couple more years when I've read them both a couple more times, mm-hmm. and uh, I know I have more to learn. This is on one subject where I'm 100% a student. But remember this: the only thing I'm going to tell you, I'm sure your brother told you this. Oh everything, yeah, every day, every okay. day, <laughs> every, everything could be right, 100 percent, million yeah. good people, the yeah. country's good, everything, and you know what? You know, you're more safe in a in a country. The United States is not safe anymore. Yeah. There's a lot of Christians there, a lot of people that profess to be Christians but yeah. really aren't Christians, yeah. Yeah. because you can say you're a Christian, but if you're living in a pattern of sin, if you're not living like a Christian, you're not a Christian. Yep, yeah. doesn't matter. But that's the one separation. I understand. And that's important, and that's that's something you really need to figure out and think about. Because if he is the only way to heaven, no matter how good you are, no matter what, how great the country is, doesn't matter. How religious is the mob? How what? How religious is the mob? You know the funny thing. Guys used to go to church. I mean, I grew up a Catholic from kindergarten right through high school. I was an altar boy the whole bit. But for me, Christian, I mean, Catholicism was like a subject in school. You know, a lot of rules, a lot of regulations. You're going to hell. You don't do this. It was like, okay, I got it. Okay, but don't bother me with it right now, you know. But yet you see guys that, you know, maybe last night they had to kill somebody. And then on Ash Wednesday, they got ashes on their head. (laughs) I always thought that was kind of ironic. But you saw a lot of that. You know, did they they truly believe? Yeah, They believed in God. Yeah, they believed in God. No question about it. But did they act that way? No. How did they reconcile that? How did they put the two together? I'll tell you how we reconcile it. You know, Halloween night, 1975, I take a blood oath, you know, and I devote my life to, uh, to the mafia, Cosa Nostra. And when you take that oath, you say this, no matter what, this comes first before anything else in my life. If your mother is sick and dying, you're at her bedside, we call you, you got to leave your mother and go there. That's the commitment you're making, right? Okay. So you're told straight out, you make a mistake, we have policy in that life. You never mess with anybody's wife, daughter, sister, mother. Yep. Death. Yep. You sell drugs right now, you're going to die. During my era, you weren't allowed to deal with drugs. It was a great rule. Couldn't do it. All right? Well, guys doing it on the side, sneaking around, yeah. But you couldn't do it, right? And they tell you straight out, you break a rule, your best friend may walk you into a room, and you don't walk out again because you can't violate the rules. Yep. Okay, so that's what you live by, and you get it so that you justify certain things. Well, this guy broke the rule. I'll tell you what happened to me one night, Andrew. In that life, you're always gonna be put on a spot at some point in time. So there was, without getting into the whole story, because I've said it so many times, I was walked into a room one night, didn't know if I was gonna walk out again. Was I scared? You bet, Mm -hmm. because I knew the experience. I was a captain at that point. I was scared. People said, why didn't you cut and run? It was robotic at that point. Hey, if this is it, this is it, you know? Gonna die, I'm gonna die. I had to walk down the stairs into a basement apartment. When that door opened, I knew the setup. I said, this might be my last breath. I don't know how I didn't faint, I'm gonna be honest with you. And I, I'm not a scary guy, I could live up to things. But anyway, I'm here, it worked out. But I get in the car with the guy that drove me there, who was my best friend, good friend. I knew him my whole life. And when I got in the car, he had driven me there. And I was getting, I was ready to blast him. I was saying, you didn't prepare me for any of this, right? And he said, Mike, stop. Before you say anything, he said, this could have been real serious. You held yourself in there really well tonight. Could have been a problem. Now, he says that to me. I said, you knew that? You're driving me possibly to my death. You're my good friend. I know you my whole life. You do that to me? And he turned around. He looked at me. He said, if it was the other way around, would you have told me? And I said, no. He said, it's the life we lead, right? So, but that's, you're so programmed that even if your best friend violates something, you're going to, you're going to take that guy out and you, but you justify it. Well, he knew the rules. Shouldn't have broke the rules. I knew the rules. Tried to get away with it. Didn't get away with it. The problem is there's a lot of treachery in that life. People die for other reasons, politics, the whole bit, you know, a lot Of of stuff happens, but you know, you justify what you're doing. So even if you're a Catholic, okay, well, listen, we both played by the rules. This guy knew it. That guy, so what I did wasn't bad. Yep. We're a disciplined society. We're men. We act like men. Yep. We're not There's supposed rules. to yeah. break the rules. So you you justify it. Even though a Ten command, well, murder is murder. Well, in my case, it's okay. You can't justify it. But you do. So were guys religious? I mean, they still could have killed somebody and still believe they were religious because... 
he broke the rule. Yeah, it's interesting. I know, I know exactly what you're saying. I know exactly what you're talking about. I have some questions. I don't know if you can answer them. Sure. But I want to ask, what did you do with all that money? <laughs> what did you why, spend it on? Why, why is that one of the first questions I get asked all the time? I'm just curious. You're making all that money. It's, it's the 80s, 90s, whatever it is. What do, you, what do you spend it on? I don't know. What do you even buy? Well, you know, I had three homes. And, uh, I had a house in Florida, a house in New York, a house in uh, California. I had my own jet plane. Yeah. You're familiar with that. Yeah. I had a helicopter. Yeah. I had uh, three boats, you know. So I, I spent money, you know, I did at that time. But I was young and I was enjoying it. But uh, listen... You know how they exaggerate and they lie, right? There was a story out in, uh, I think it was the Long Island Press, so that I, was, I made $2 billion, you know, that we defrauded the government out of $2 billion and all this stuff. It wasn't that much. Yeah. Not a lot of money, but it wasn't that much. But, you know, listen, everybody believes, you know, they wrote a book about an investigator that tried to find where I had my money buried, or I shouldn't say buried, but in different banks around the, yeah, yeah. the world. And they couldn't find it. And they actually wrote a book and the investigator that hired them. I mean, they got a bunch. They got, you know, probably 50, 60 million from me, you yeah. know. But uh, I'm not going to answer anymore. I, <laughs> can, I understand completely. You got about I, as much out of me as you're going to get. I, but, I understand completely. People, I, I completely understand. It, I, I know exactly what you're saying. I understand you, sir. You I understand. It. I understand. It. Yeah. It's... Uh, it's actually, it's kind of, I don't know. The reason I asked that question is I don't know if the world was easier then than it is now, but if you have any money now trying to keep hold of it, I don't trust the, I don't trust the banks. I don't, listen, what happens in America? Just what happened two years ago, Thursday afternoon, I forget the name of the bank. I didn't have any money in that bank. Everything is fine. The bank manager gets on the CEO of the bank on Thursday afternoon. Don't worry about it. These are all nonsense. Not so your money is safe. hundred percent Friday morning. The bank goes under. Yep. They lie to you. Yep. You can't trust these people. Yep. Stock market, the same thing. I know. I mean, I had guys on it, you know, that we were doing things with penny stocks and everything back then. So I don't trust these people. I'm not saying, you know, you, you don't want to throw the blanket over everybody. Yeah. But does stuff go, uh, uh, you know that, does stuff go on like that? Are these people dishonest? 100%. Yep. Why do you want to trust them? It's true. And it's getting harder and harder to, I, the reason I asked the money question is because, 80s, 90s might have been a different game. But in the world today, especially if you make any money, it's very difficult you to can't, get hold of. You can't hide it. You, it's it, very difficult. You, you, can't. you can't hide it. That's right. And yeah. if they want to get it, they can find the right piece of paper to take it off you. 100%. And plus the paper money today in our country, it's, it, it could be worthless tomorrow morning. That's right. You we're, could be putting that, money in your basement. It could be worthless tomorrow morning. We're not far off. No. I think the uh, American dollar has lost 25% of its purchasing power since 2020. And they're just printing, 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 printing. That's their answer to everything is just to print more money for this endless. Yeah, and there's nothing to back it up. That's right. And this wars around zero. the world. The only thing they have is violence and threats. That's right. That's right. Everything comes back down to violence and threats. Yeah, the world's a certainly interesting place. Where do you think we're going? You know, yeah, I, I, I'm the opposite of you. Okay. In, in that I'm a very optimistic guy. Thank God. Someone my, has to do it. No, my wife gets Thank mad God. at me. You know, how are we going to, don't worry about it. I'm going to handle it. It's all going to be okay. I, it's my famous word. She said, don't ever tell me, don't worry about it. Because <laughs> you said that to me the day before they locked you up and I didn't see you for eight years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. told them. I said, I get it. But I am extremely pessimistic about my country. Yeah. I think, number one, I think it's biblical. Yeah. I think we're, I don't want to say we're in the end times. The end times could be a thousand years away from now. But I think my country is in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. I really mean it. And especially if this election doesn't turn out right. Yep. I, I, we're going downhill fast. Andrew, how do you get out from under $34 trillion worth of debt? You don't. You, you can't. You can't. It's impossible. There has to be a crash at some point in time. They're printing money like it's water. Yep. The money really doesn't have any value. It's, 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 a, it, it's an imaginary value at this point. Ponzi scheme. Yep. You know, so how do you get out from under it? You don't. And they have no intention of fixing it. They don't know how to fix it. They don't want to fix it because it doesn't affect them. Yep. So what are you going to do? You know, you hate to say, people have asked me, you know, Michael, would you trust Trump with your daughter? I said, what a stupid question. Why do I have to trust him with my daughter? What does that have to do with him being a president of the United States and doing a job for my country? Yep. Well, you know, 15 years ago, you got this guy. Who do, what do I care what he did 15 years ago in a hotel with a woman? But this, but this is, you've just put, you've just absolutely nailed it because this is the, the true conversation and this is the true split in society now. You have logical arguments and people who believe in logic and common sense. What you said is absolutely logical. 
He can be the president of the United States and he can fix the country and has nothing to do because he doesn't have to meet my daughter. And you have emotional arguments. And emotional arguments are absolutely subjective and they throw everything out the water and you ignore all of the general rules of life and exceptions disprove rules and it's all insanity with emotional arguments. And that's what they do. This is why they try and destroy masculinity, which is logical, and push all of these constant emotional arguments with nearly every PSYOP. Let's look at a PSYOP. Climate change. Whether climate change is true or not isn't even the conversation we need to have. Because when they pass legislation regarding climate change, it's a Trojan horse for a bunch of things that have nothing to do with the climate. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. They want to raise taxes, raise your, raise their wages, destroy your ability to go anywhere, take away your freedom, all for the climate. And if you sit down and logically say, please explain to me how me paying more taxes will stop the sun from being hot. They'll answer and say, oh, but don't you care about trees? Emotional argument. Oh, you like, you like trees, right? Well, yeah. I'll go, the trees. So you don't care about trees? How do you feel about trees? It's all emotional. They throw all logic out the window. So when someone says that stupid asinine, when someone asks you that stupid. asinine question, yeah, it's emotionality. They're, they're thinking with their emotional side of their brain. They're not being logical. No, and let me tell you why it's so scary now. You had Trump has a record. He spent four years as president. He has a record. Yeah. The other guy has a record. Yeah. Okay. It should be yeah. a cut and shot. Compare the two records. You sit down with somebody and say, tell me why you hate Donald Trump. They really can't answer you. What did this guy do? Did he murder somebody in your family? Did he rape your wife? What did he do that this unreal hatred is out there for him? I don't get it. Yep. They can't answer you because there is no answer. The guy has a record. He was a good president. Forget anything else he did in his life. Well, you know, he was involved with the mob. So what? If he was, first of all, he wasn't. I know that for a fact. Yep. He and I had the same attorney at one time, Roy Cohen. I met Donald once for five minutes at a club, said hello. He didn't do anything with the mob. People think if you if you know somebody that all of a sudden you're connected and you're doing all these bad things. Yep. Yep. You never did any. Do you know what they did to me? This was in uh, when they were doing the Mueller investigation, right? Back in 80, the early 80s, 82 or 83, I had a Russian partner. Best partner I ever had, by the way. Great. We were in the gas business for stealing tax money. Okay, it was great. But they were good partners. We spent, we bought, we uh, paid six million dollars for a couple of ho- uh, condos in Trump Towers. Right. Nice. He had a KGB uh, relative or something. Do you know that during the Mueller investigation? Now this is in the early '80s. They came to me and said, "We know you and Bogatin spent six million dollars at Trump Towers." I said, "In 1982, it's like 30 something years ago. What about it?" Well, what was the connection between, you know, you and Donald and, uh, and this Russian guy? I says, wait a second. Russian, Mueller investigation. Jesus. Are you trying to say that because we bought uh, condos in Trump Towers in the early 80s, that there was some kind of Russian connection because I had a Russian partner that had nothing to do with Trump? I said, do me a favor, subpoena me. I want to go in front of the Mueller investigation and talk yep. about this. Yes, yep. I said, you people are insane. Absolutely. Insane. That's how far they stretch. Another thing, they have these laws they pass. Friday night, they get a bill. You know, 1,200 pages. Yep. Saturday morning, they're voting on it. Yep. They didn't even read it. Of course not. How could you trust these people? And I try to have this argument. I said, listen, I'm all for you. I'm for your family. I'm for this country. You have to be able to see what's going on here and don't let them pull the wool over your eyes. That's right. Yeah. But, and, but the primary weapon they use to dif- dispute that perfect logic is an emotional argument. They'll say, oh, yeah, but some people who cross the border are good people. We never said they weren't. That has nothing to do nothing with at border all to do security. With that has nothing to do with it. No. They, they, they try and inject this emotionality because emotionality allows them to pull off their psyops most easily, which is why they're so afraid of masculinity because masculinity, we reject the emotional side of our brains if we know we have a, a, a larger purpose. Emotionally, we want to get off the Titanic. But logically, we know it's not our job. We're not supposed right. to. We have to stay on the Titanic. That's the masculine mind. The female mind is more prone to, call me a misogynist, emotionality, which is their superpower. But that's what they're good at. But it's, but it's and we true. need them for it. Yeah, but I mean, that's the way it is. So why reject it? It's true. Absolutely. But if they, can, if they can get a whole society, because we're two halves of the perfect whole, if they can get a whole society thinking emotionally, well, then they can manipulate us en masse, right? Because they can come along with fear or with... Uh, empathy with some emotion they can put together a nice fancy video they did it in europe i don't know if you follow european politics but when the boats started arriving 
after Hillary decided to destroy Libya because they didn't want to use the dollar mm -hmm. anymore, and after they decided to destroy Syria and because there's no IMF bank, right. blah, blah, blah. After they started all these wars and killed all these millions of people while Obama was getting the Nobel Peace Prize, mm -hmm. after they did all of this, when they started getting on boats, migrating to Europe because their countries were destroyed, I said, yeah, what's happened to them is unfair. Yeah, we did it, but no, don't let them in. Maybe that makes me insensitive. Maybe that makes me a bad person, but I know how it ends for European society. So don't let them in. Don't let them in. They started letting them in. Everyone was talking about it. They put on the news some kid which drowned. Terrible. Four-year-old kid drowned. Terrible. It was the only clip they played for six months. And by the end of it, everyone was saying, oh, but the kids, but the children, but the kids, but the kids, oh, the kids, the kids, the kids. Emotional arguments. I was saying, they show you one kid. There's millions of exactly. military-age males who we just discussed earlier how their life path's going to turn out and why it's going to involve violence at some point or crime at some point. You're talking about one child they put on the news. Who says that child, now I'm at the point, I'm so crazy. Who says that child even drowned there? Who mm -hmm. says that didn't happen back in Libya? Who would they even get this clip from? It's all a psyop, it's all a scam. And this is why you have to be able to reject your emotionality and think logically and think, oh, well, what's the best move on the chessboard? But this is why they try and push emotional arguments into everything. All this LGBT crap is emotional arguments. I'm sorry. That individual has a penis. That's a man. Mm -hmm. Oh, but they feel like a girl. I don't care how they feel. I, it doesn't, I, it doesn't it's matter. It's it doesn't matter. But the, the people who adhere to it are like, ah, but the feelings, the feelings hold paramount. The feelings don't hold paramount. There's right and there's wrong and there's true and there's false. It's insanity. And uh, it's insanity. And this is the society they want that's completely emotionally led because once they have everybody absolutely emotional, then what they're going to do is come along and scare us, which is what they always do. So always. They proved it during a severe winter of illness and death. Be afraid, be now, afraid. And that's afraid. coming again now. Now it's bird flu. Oh yeah. They're already, they're already starting to, you know, plant those seeds, getting people nervous about it. Or climate change. Yeah. Climate there, change. There's people standing in roads right now saying, we're all going to die in 10 years. They said that 10 years ago. Yeah. Why do they pass these laws saying that for climate change, X, Y, Z, put up their wages and buy beachfront property if they're so scared of the ocean? Yeah. How does that work? They're closest to the ocean. <laughs> they're building. How come the banks have no problem doing 100-year leases, 100-year mortgages, or 100-year loans for beachfront condos, right? right? They, they don't seem to be scared the ocean's no, coming. If it's gone in 12 years, it, right. the, the whole thing is the biggest PSYOP scam. And, and we're now at a point with government and authority, it's actually kind of scary, where you can't trust them to make a law on anything because every single law they pass is Trojan Horst. Every single one is psyop there's not a single law they'll pass about anything that if you were to read those 1,200 pages, you wouldn't start going, wait, 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 what's this? Why is this in here? What's this garbage? They do it with absolutely everything. Every single bill they pass, every single dollar they print, there's a whole bunch of junk in there. We've completely lost control of the democratic process. Nobody even knows what laws are passed. No, Nobody knows have. anything anymore. They're having a clue. And what they're doing too, Andrew, most of the people, okay, are, are trying to feed their families. Yeah. They don't have time to look at all of this. That's right. You and I, we have the luxury. We can watch the news. We can talk to, we can see, we can do that. That's right. These people don't have a clue. That's right. They don't have a clue. And you, you know what? You can't blame them. They're trying to put food on their table. They're trying to pay for their mortgage. Which they're is getting harder and harder. It's getting harder and harder. So they're not paying attention. So somebody gets up there and says, oh, I'm going to do this, that, that, that. Oh, okay. You got my vote. They believe. They're distracted by the permanent rat race. Yeah. I don't even know how most people are surviving anymore. I remember- I don't I, get it I either. Don't, I don't know. I, and I've looked at a bunch of statistics about the oncoming financial crash, and they're saying that most people aren't. Most bills are unpaid. Credit card debt's higher than ever. Higher car, than ever. Yeah, car default's higher than ever. Mortgage yeah. default higher than ever. It's all about to blow up like 2008. But I think back to when I was, say, 21 or 22. My brother had a job. I had a job. Both low-income jobs. We both made about 1000 a month. We had 2000 We had a car between us. We had an apartment. We had food. We went to training every day. We had clothes. And we mm -hmm. survived. I, I don't even know how much I spend now because I know I've lost touch with reality. But it, it, to have a nice car and a nice house and to pay your bills and pay your taxes and to be able to go on a few holidays and to have some clothes and to put gas in your cars and have a little bit spare for emergencies, you need 15, 20, 25,000 a month. Easy. To, to, to just to live the most basic, normal basic. life. It's insane. It's Nobody not, can make this money. No. At one time, that was a lot of money. It's, oh, you'd be a very rich man on 20 grand a month. You're surviving now on that. It's, it's absolutely crazy how quickly that's happened. I know. And, and it's good to a point. I met, uh, I went to see, this is about a year ago. Well, this is when I totally realized I've lost all touch with money. 
And it was about, no, it was about two, maybe two, two and a half years ago. Dan Bilzerian, I knew him from before. He's, really, mm-hmm. he's actually a very nice guy. He was, in, he was in France and I'm here in Romania. And he said, I'll come over and say hi. I said, all right. So I got a jet from here to France and then there was six of us. We all got a five-star hotel and six different hotel rooms. And then we had a security team with us because I go security everywhere. And then we ate out a couple times and then we were with Dan at his place for five minutes and we did a, a video game thing. And then we uh, decided to drive back to Romania so we, we shipped some cars from here, there, and we took a four-day road trip through Italy, back through France, all the way back to Romania. Mm-hmm. And I sat down and I said, Tristan, he goes, what? And I said, by the time we flew in and out on jets and got security in six five-star hotel rooms and ate and moved the Lambos and drove the Lambos and the gas, to the, we just spent like $350,000 mm-hmm. in four days saying hi to a friend. Mm-hmm. That's how ridiculously expensive the world's become. Yeah. And, and then... We can always tie everything back, right? It's super interesting because now all of that's on Instagram. So you have young women sitting there going, that's the kind of boyfriend I want. And it's like, okay, well, there's, there's like 10 of them. Yeah. <laughs> so, so good luck. Yeah. <laughs> so everyone's chasing this lifestyle. Men feel, we talk about male depression, male suicide. Well, men feel happy when they're respected. Mm-hmm. A lot of men don't feel respected because the world's obsessed with this fantasy of, that I'm living fantasy but it's it's unique it's rare right women want that and only that which is fine mm-hmm. that's what i'm raising my daughter to do i don't want her to have anything else but we talk again about broken gender dynamics and how this all ties in we've never had a period in, in human history where you were constantly spying on everyone else's life and not just their life you're only spying on the highlights of their life all of the time right. so how does that affect the human psyche i think about me as a person i was i'm at the weird age where when I was 13, there was no mobile phones. And when I was 16, everyone had a mobile phone in school. It's like it went from nothing to like MSN Everything. Messenger in school. And so it, I remember the, the transition between the two. And the amount of gossip, the amount of bullying, the amount the world changed when MSN Messenger came out was massive, right? Mm-hmm. right? The, 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 society, yes. the whole thing changed within two years. I can't imagine being 12 or 13 now. You've got Instagram and Twitter, and you're yeah, seeing murder all world. over the news, and you're seeing these girls who are on boats at 18, and you see the, the guys living this crazy life like I do with money, and you're sitting there and you try and get a job, and it's 25,000 a year, and like everyone's minds must just be a mess. Everything's messed up, and 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 then and then you look at the the mentality of a lot of these people, and I talk about this from my perspective because I I primarily talk to younger guys. And, and they've gotten to a point where they're just apathetic and they're just gamblers. They're like, well, I'll just gamble on crypto or I'll gamble on the stock market. I don't stand a chance of getting out with hard work. I don't stand a chance of getting out with education. I don't stand a chance of having a woman who loves me without, without money. So I'm just, just going to just gamble. Just gamble on meme coins or just gamble on the stock market. And if I lose, I'll just sit in my bedroom and play video games. I give up. They're just giving up on the system, giving up on society. They're no longer waking up saying, if I work hard and train hard and be a good person, I can build a good society. And, that's, just what given, you, and that's what you're teaching. And that's what I'm trying to teach them to do because they've just given up. They, they just don't care anymore. At a young age. At a very young age because they're seeing too much too early. And I can't even imagine myself at age 12 seeing all this. How would I end up? It, it's weird. Because they're saying to themselves, I'm never going to be in that position. You know, we're spending all that kind of money and doing... So they give up. They give up. And, and also, not just they give up, but they, they sit and they think, well... That's all that I. That's all that matters. That's all I want. That's all that success is. I don't care about. And I try and make it very hard. That's why I always mention that I was broke for the longest time, and that's when I actually became the person I am. I don't think money changes you. I think money amplifies you. I think if you're a, a real man and you get rich, you're a good man, like Trump or like us. If you're a pussy and you get rich, mm-hmm. you become worse than ever. You become yeah. a, like we talked a weak dictatorial, insane, insane, evil person. And we're surrounded by them. That's right. So you need the, you need all of the character building, bad times being broke. You need all that before you're rich. The worst thing that can happen to you is you get rich at 19. Imagine a 19 year old boy is filthy rich. He's yeah. an idiot. So, but, but society's just got them all messed up now. Mm-hmm. And I feel like they've lost vested interest in the future of themselves and society, which probably ties back into why people are getting away with what they're getting away with. Cause they look at the politicians and go, oh, it's a scam anyway. It's all I owe. Yeah. Who cares? It's all bullshit. I give up. I don't stand a chance anyway. I give up. I give up. I give up. I don't care. Let all burn. Let's make memes and make fun and of it. Burning. A lot of that. I, that's all you see. Yeah. There's like the world is burning. And instead of trying to put it out, let's just laugh at it. Burn. It's all just one big joke. Ha ha ha. It's all burning. Oh, well, oops. Who cares? There's a lot of that. And then you look at it from a global perspective. 
How can a Western country compete when its youth thinks that compared to a country whose youth don't believe that? A country whose youth believe, no, we're going to work hard and we're going to dedicate ourselves and our nation's going to take over. Because it's easy to become champ. It's hard to stay champ. Yeah. And, that, and, and that's the problem with America now. You're trying to stay champ. Well, there's people coming for your belt, Rocky. And, you know, Mr. T's training and he's built different because he's hungry. Mm-hmm. And we don't have that hunger in our society no. anymore. It's all gone. Know. So how long can we truly possibly compete? You go down, deeper down the rabbit hole, you realize the only reason we're still competing is because we can print the dollar and we can game the financial system and we can lie and cheat and we can print these dollars because we're the global reserve currency. How long is that going to last? Who knows? But I guess the scary thing, the thing that's interesting to me is, and I'd be interested in your point of view on this, how does American social and societal collapse look? Because in other countries, when society collapses, I feel like they have something to a degree that unifies them. Even if it's just a homogen, uh, the homogeny of their race or their color. Mm-hmm. I'll give it a very quick example. When I first moved to Romania eight years ago, I said, there was two girls walking to the park at three in the morning. I was on my way home from a nightclub. And I was talking to the taxi driver and I said, in London, girls don't walk alone at night. But is it normal here for girls to walk alone at night? And he said, those are Romanian girls. A Romanian man wouldn't hurt a Romanian girl. Mm. Won't see that in America. Wow. You won't hear that in America. Wow. Wow. You won't hear that in America or the West anywhere because we're so divided now, right? So how does societal collapse in America even look? Because in other countries, I feel like if it collapses, there's still a degree of sanctity. Let's look at Russia, Ukraine. My opinion on that is semi-controversial. I totally understand why Putin did what he did. They try and say he's a bad guy. They always do that on the news. If you actually look at the history of it, he defended Russia. He may have attacked first, but he was defending himself. Blah, blah, blah. Ukraine is being getting hammered with these missiles and they've lost their electricity and they've been getting destroyed and they're losing this war and they're never going to win in a million years. Everyone knows it. They're a NATO puppet. We're sending their men to die to try and influence Russia, blah, blah. That's a whole different argument. Has Ukraine had any mass riots? Any mass looting? They're at war. The, the society, there's no police force. Everyone's standing in line with their hyperinflated currency, buying food in line. There's mm-hmm. civil law and order because they're unified by God and they're unified by their belief and love for Ukraine. In America, if there's a tornado or a flood or anything, what, what ends up happening? Looting. <laughs> Within five minutes. Within five minutes, it's just like, oh, crime. <laughs> Straight back to crime. Like we don't, we, America can't handle, America's so fragile societally, it can't handle any struggle. It's falling apart with privilege. How's it going to s- survive with struggle? The eclipse that just happened mm-hmm. a, a month ago or whatever. I saw on Twitter, they're saying the eclipse, there's a a warning, stay in your house because of the eclipse. And I said, Tristan, isn't it crazy that a country has to warn people that if it gets dark for two minutes, crime might happen. Yes. If the sun goes down, crime will happen. Yes. It happens every day. But if it happens at a different time of day, society will break down. That doesn't happen anywhere else. Do you think when there's an eclipse over Thailand or Russia, they all start panicking and putting the military on the street? It doesn't matter. It's an eclipse. Okay, cool. Back to back to work. Back to life. America's so fragile that I'm I'm very interested in what your view on what the implosion will look like because I think it's going to be worse than nearly anything we've ever seen. Yeah. I, I you know, there's unfortunately we have forces in America now that hate America. Just yeah. hate America, and they're very vocal about it. Nothing happens to them. You can say it, you, you know. Let me, let me tell you, for me, we are becoming a godless society. And when God is taken out of anywhere, and there's no belief in there, the country falls apart. Yeah. That's what's happening now. He's being chased out. Yep. Can't talk to him about him. You can't mention him. Yep. If you go out and protest in front of an, an, an abortion clinic, you get locked up. And when I mean protest, just sit there and Read the Bible to somebody. Yep. You go to jail for that. Yep. They lock you up for that. With and free speech in a free country. Free speech in a, f- a free Christian country. Christian country. Yeah. Yet you can, you know, you can protest. You can do You can, you know, at the parade we had, we had a parade. Do you know that they're walking around the LGBTQ? I don't even know yeah. the, the, the number, the alphabet, right? Do you know that they're in drag with practically no clothes on? This is a parade with families there. Yep. And they're doing all of this stuff right out in the open, and it's okay. If it, you say anything wrong about it, you get in trouble for it. Oh, it's a Trojan horse. It's a Trojan horse for sexual perversion. Yeah. So what's happening? The country is just there's nothing there holding it together anymore. Yeah. 
there's really no national pride. Yeah. And if there is national pride, they're fighting against those that have no national pride. Right. So you see these two forces. So what's it going to look like? It's going to be a total collapse. I, I think so. It's total collapse. And this is, this is why Trump's win is so important. Because it's not, just about, it's not just about the laws he'll pass. It's about the culture. It's about people believing in America again. It's about people believing in Americanism. It's about people saying USA, USA, USA. It's about them believing in their, it's the culture yeah. that we need back. People need to be proud of America again. Trump can bring that. He can bring that because now the other side is demonizing those people that voted for Trump. Yeah. This is half the country. You're dividing half the country instead of trying to bring people together. You know, I always had two things on the, on the street. You learned something. I learned this. You know, the best way to defeat your enemies is to make them your friends. People don't understand this mentality, okay? And obviously, you know, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. Yeah, yeah. So if your enemies, that you still know your enemies, if they think you're their friend, well, then you can, you can watch them. You could be careful. You could be on alert with them. Yeah. These people are not even smart enough to know that. Instead of demonizing half the country, yep. calling out MAGA people, calling them deplorable, call, this is half the country that you're in control of. You know, they don't want to bring people together. They want division. I'm telling you, this election, I, I'm, I'm concerned that there's going to be a violent eruption. Whoever wins. Yep. Because I just went on Rumble recently. Mm -hmm. It was a good experience because you can speak your mind on there. Absolutely. You can say whatever you want to say. But if you see the comments, first of all, the comments are this long, yep. okay? People are really aware of what's going on on Rumble. There's lunatics too, but for the most part, they're aware. And if you see the anger, oh my gosh, yep. the anger against the other side, you know, and it goes both ways. Whatever happens in this election, there's going to be an eruption somewhere. There's no question. Absolutely. People are just too angry and too divided. And, 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 you, and can you blame them? No, no. They have a right to feel that way. Yeah. And, and, but they want division. The people at the top want division. That's they don't the want unity. That's right. They want it. That's the problem because you're right. People are justified in their anger, but they want anger because they want us against they each want other. It. There has to be, if we had to solve the world, and we come back to God because this is the easy answer, but there has to be something to unify people because there used to even just be the unity of everyone. You used to be able to say something simple like having children is beautiful. Love your children. Something as simple as that will get you backlash now. You can sit and say, women should want to find a man they love and have children. That Try and say that online. You're a misogynist. They'll go you're, nuts. You're right. They'll, you, that, they'll go that's nuts That's misogyny that. now. You can't even... I really, truly believe, and this is one of the things I find most interesting about American politics. It's the only country in the world where I've seen the subject of abortion so heavily politicized, whether in other countries it's legal or illegal, whatever. But there are people marching around demanding the ability to murder their own kids. And whether you believe in abortion or not, it's not even the argument. I'm saying there are people who will decide who leads their country economically, militarily, the leader of their nation, all based on whether someone in some other state can kill their own kid or not. Yeah. Who, like this is insanity to it me. Is How have they managed to come along with something like this and psyop it to the point where everyone's screaming about murdering babies as opposed to, I don't know, the inflation rate. It's completely, it's completely insane. I have members of my family who were super liberal, super pro Biden, da, da, and, and even they have admitted that Biden's messed up and everything was better under Trump. And last time I spoke to one of them, they said, yeah, Biden messed up, everything's better under Trump, but I can't vote for Trump because of Roe versus Wade. I'm like, who cares? What does who it have to do with anything? Who cares? Grow up. Like, you haven't even had any abortions. Exactly. What is this? Exactly. Like, on what planet are these people operating? Pure emotional argument garbage. Yeah. Maybe the world, world could go to hell. Inflation could be through the roof. There could be wars all over the place. You're losing your house. You don't have a car to drive anymore. But I'm worried about abortion. I never had one. I may never have one, but that's what I'm going to worry about. And, and the way they managed to psy up the populace into this constant and endless obsession to women running around screaming about how proud they are they have one or how mad they are they can't have one. You know what really upsets me most about abortion? What's so insane about it is, <clears throat> it's not like getting pregnant is like catching cancer where you, you can't help. You can stop yourself getting pregnant. Of course. <laughs> a, a lot of different ways. Very easy. To is it just a, oops, I don't want to ever have to take responsibility for my actions thing? Is it just, is it just a... Uh, a uh, metaphor for the mentality that allows you to say, no matter what stupid things I do, 
I, I don't have to be responsible for anything I've ever done. I don't know what it is. Maybe also people wouldn't be so obsessed with killing their own kids if they could afford to have them. Maybe if you fix the inflation rate and you fix the fact that people can't buy homes and you fix the country, people might be more interested in keeping their own children. I don't know, maybe. Plus the big lie is that it's a women's health issue. Why is it a woman's health issue? I've had seven kids. Yeah. The, the health of the mother was never an issue. Yeah. They say it's women's health, it has nothing to do. Now, if there was a case when, you know, and, and this is rare, when it's the mother's life or the child's life, yep. okay. But normal, rational people will deal with that in a rational way. Yep. Okay, you know, if that were the case, I want my wife to live. Of course. You know, we understand that. But every abortion issue is not a women's health issue, but that's what they keep, that's the center point. Women's health, women's health, it has nothing to do with women's health. Of course. It has to do with, I want the kid or I don't want the kid. Period. And that's the final point of, of the demonic mindset, right? We talked earlier about selfishness. They're convincing young women to be so selfish, so self-obsessed, that they are proud of murdering their own children yeah. that they created, that they could have prevented even beginning to grow, and then putting on a t-shirt, look what I did, I'm a good person. Yeah. Like the absolute end state of the slave mind, the absolute end state of demonic. When I see this insanity, only in America, in any other country in the world that abortion's legal in, it's never celebrated. No matter how fallen some of these other countries are, even America, even, even uh, maybe UK, I'm not sure. But if you were to go to Italy, France, or any of these other Western nations, if a woman has an abortion, it's a very unfortunate, unhappy yeah. event, and that's it. There's none of this celebration of it. There's none of this happy, look what I did. It's crazy how far the PSYOP has gotten in. This is another thing that might get me in a little bit of trouble, but this is where I think men have failed society so much because evolutionarily, I don't know if you've ever read the book War Brides, but it was about, it was about French women who ended up marrying German soldiers. And it was saying that the Germans kicked the French, they beat them. Mm -hmm. And across three or four years, the French women, even though the Germans had killed their husbands, the Germans had money, they had provision, they were the power structure, they were respected, they were feared, they had wages. The French men didn't have anything if they were alive. And all the French women ended up going with the, the German men. And it's talking about how the power of these men were attractive. And no matter how much they were resentful for the fact they killed their husband, over time, women are more likely to just adhere to power structures because they can't defend themselves. So their self-preservation strategy is to adhere to a power structure. Their self-preservation strategy is, well, I can't fight. I mean, obviously exceptions don't disprove the rules. There were women who were part of the French resistance, of course. But in general, like, well, I can't fight. These guys are here. They have the guns. They won the war. They killed my husband. They're strong. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. And that's how they kind of bend towards thing. And it talked about going all the way back to tribal, tribalism. When tribes would go and kill another tribe, they'd kill all the men who can fight and they'd take the women. Mm -hmm. And the women can either bend to the rules of the new tribe or get killed. So it's like, well, bend to the rules of the tribe. So anyway, when you read this book, what he kind of concludes, he says at the end is that women are going to adhere, whether they like it or not, in general, to the power structure they see as most fearsome and have the most respect for. If that's their father, they'll adhere to their father. If that's their husband, they'll adhere to their husband. If that's society, if that's sex in the city and abortion and all this garbage and feminism, whatever, then they'll adhere to that. So when I say men have failed, I'm not attacking women here. I'm saying men have failed because I believe if you raise a daughter well, she doesn't want to scream about having abortions. Right. I believe if you raise a daughter well and you do your job as a man, she doesn't want to watch Sex in the City and be a whore. I don't think she wants to do that. I think if you're a good father, these things won't happen. So I think men are failing. I can even say now, I, I, you can call me a misogynist. They'll cut this up and call me a horrible person. If my girlfriend put something on TV, she wouldn't ever. But let's say she put Sex in the City on, I'll say, turn that crap off. Why? Because it's crap and I don't want to see it and you're not going to watch it. Turn it off. It's my job to protect your mind, mm -hmm. to protect you physically and mentally. It's my job to protect. That's my job. I'm protecting right. you from all the garbage. I'm, and that's what I'm going to do. We agree on that. I, I, 100%. <laughs> Why do you want to put trash in, in somebody's mind? Just because somebody produces something, that doesn't mean we have to accept it or I say it's great. Yeah, bring it into my house. I love it. But see, you say that and people, oh, you know, you're a male chauvinist. You know, you're trying to control your woman's mind. No, I'm not. I'm trying to get trash out of her head the same way she might say that to me. Why are you watching that? Yep. Tur turn it off. Absolutely. We care, we care about each other. If you love anything, they call you hateful. So when you see this abortion stuff and you see all this insane feminism, you say, see all this LGBT crap, that, this is the failure of men. You're a man. Stand up and prevent anyone you care about being poisoned by this. Mm -hmm. Do whatever it takes. And there has to become a point where you don't, 
lazy about it. I, I watched that guy try to reprogram his daughters in his car on YouTube. Okay, he did a good job trying to reproduce, reprogram them. Why are they going to that school? Yeah. Why don't they move school? Oh, well, you know, it's hard for them to move school. It's a long drive. Then drive them. <laughs> then, then do what it takes. There's a degree of apathy and laziness. Right. There's a degree of fear of being called a bad name. There's a degree of fear of being a coward. There's a degree of fear of their wife telling them off. I don't know what it is, but they're allowing this, these huge power structures these, these dominant forces, which you see all over the internet, all in the educational system, all in the media, all over Netflix, to get control of the women they care about and send them insane. And they're sitting there and watching it happen. Most men aren't raising their kids. The school and internet is raising their kids. YouTube raises your children. The iPad raises your children. What's on the internet? Well, a lot of stuff, good and bad. Yeah. You can't police all of it, right? You're busy, like you said, working your ass off for a dollar trying to pay the bills. It's getting harder and harder, but I still think this is the failure of men. I'd really like to talk to one of these women. If I ever get free from this and I ever do go to America, I can't wait to go to a feminist rally. <laughs> oh, and uh, and, and do, ask, I'll just ask them the question. I'll say, why are you so happy to murder children? Yeah. Well, what's so, do you know who your father is? Like, like let's just talk. Yeah. <laughs> I hate to say, but uh, well, I don't want to go there. I'll get in trouble if I say what I was going to say. But I, I want to get back to one thing because this is important to me, and we're we're establishing a relationship now. I want to go back to religion for a minute. Sure, just for a minute. Sure. And I know you have your brother, and yeah. I'm sure you you've had very in depth discussions yeah. about it. Yeah. But when I when I came to Christ, yeah. for me, everything is about evidence. Yep. Everything, Andrew. I don't take things that everything is about evidence. You got to prove it to me. Yep. And when I did my search, without getting to all this now, I really found out that the Bible is so supported by evidence. Yeah. It's a fact. Jesus rose from the dead. It's a fact. And what separates everything else from me is if I want to enjoy eternity and be in heaven, then I have to accept Christ. Yep. And that's all I want to say. That's the bottom line. So when you do, when you study Islam and yep. you get there in two years, just remember could be a great religion. I have a lot of Islamic friends. I have so many people <laughs> online trying to trying to convert me to do. Islam. I bet you do, yeah. And you know what? They're so nice about it. Yeah. I mean, just really, we've had in-depth discussions, and I tell them the same thing. I respect, you know, so many of you I respect, so many I met in prison, they carry themselves best in prison. They really would. They, and Christians too, but yeah. they carry themselves well all the time. Uh, I said, but there's a separator for me. Either I believe in Jesus or I don't. Yeah. Either I get into heaven or I don't. I it's, it's, that's it. I and for me, I'm convinced. And I tell people, listen, I'm by far not the best Christian out there. You know, I still have you know, old thoughts in mind, and sometimes I, I act on them, sometimes I don't. But my faith is rock solid. Yeah. And it's rock solid built on evidence. I want to leave you with that. Okay? And, and, and you know, that's a perfect way to end because... Uh, like I said, Bailey, who I live with, is a devout Christian. My brother as well. They're trying to say the same things. And uh, I'm, I'm open to learning. I don't want to be a closed-minded. I, I will come to my conclusions, and God will lead me where he leads me. And I'm, I'm open to it, and I love to hear it. And, and I have absolute respect for Christianity. I really do. Thank you, friend. Thank you, sir. Thank you. If you're looking for a gift, my new book, Sit Downs with Gangsters, is available worldwide on Amazon. We've interviewed over a 1,000 people now, and we selected 10 of the hardest hitting stories to go in this book. Each chapter features the story of one of our podcast guests. Those stories are Shane Taylor, Knife Maniac's Redemption, John Elite, Mafia Hitman for the Gambino Crime Family, Joey Barnett, 35 years in UK prison, Ian Blink McDonald, six million pound bank robber, Chet Sandu, Asian smuggler in Spanish Supermax, John Lawson, the hit team commander, David Macmillan, International Smugglers, Thai Death Row, Prison Escape. John Abbott, San Quentin, Prison Shootout and Escape. Michael Francis, Colombo Crime Family Capo, portrayed in Goodfellas. And Wildman, English Enforcer in Arizona Prison. Link in description box on YouTube, available worldwide on Amazon. Also, my next book, Untouchable Jimmy Savile, is getting published in December 2023 so check that out as well it will be available worldwide on amazon thank you for listening cheers